This is our extensive comparison episode of all BMW SUVs. BMW X1 and X3 we have directly head to head because they are the most sold ones. But of course we also have the BMW X2, the BMW X4, the X5, the X6, the X7, the XM and the electric iX. Which one is the most suitable for you? Which one has different strength in which area? Let's find out together. Let's go. The two BMW bestsellers in our big comparison review, BMW X1 versus the BMW X3 SUV comparison with Thomas and Autogefühl in 4K full screen full length. Let's go here with the X1 in the front, which has the larger double kidney in the front. The new BMW design, even bolder, even stronger and colors. Blue Bay Lagoon for the X1. This greenish or turquoise node in the blue vehicle. It's a very interesting color indeed. There's also a darker blue available for the X1 if you like. And here we have the Alpine White for the X3. It's also a large double kidney. Recently also facelifted this X3, but not as large. So they have some similarities, both also equipped with the M Sport Pack. That's why they both have this black accentuation here in the lower part. The X3 being the bigger brother, of course, a little bit stronger, a little bit higher in the front. But I think both work design-wise. What's your take? Turning indicator comparison here in the front. Interesting here. This goes to the X1 because we have the dual turning indicators. And you can see it also has this pulsing effect. And maybe you have seen, it's even more obvious here now, that the daytime running light signature here is this L form, this, you know, this lying L form with the X3, but then it's kind of like just topsy-turvy with the X1. Did you see that? In the side profile, the length difference here, the BMW X1, 4 meters 50 or 177 inches, whereas 21 centimeters or 8 inches longer, here the X3 at 4 meters 71 or 185 inches. So indeed a notable length difference. Styling wise you see just a little bit higher, typical SUV style. The X1 a little bit lower, you might also argue somewhat crossover direction. Both equipped you with the M Sport Pack to compare it. Here for example with painted wheel arches each. I think it looks really cool, really sporty. Wheels here from 17 to 20 inch, these ones are the 19 inch wheels. On the X3, 18 to 21, so one inch higher each, but these are the 20 inch wheels, so also very comparable spec indeed. Which one do you like better here in the side profile? Tell me in the comments. And last but not least, about the suspension. Also pretty similar, you have a base suspension, you have a fixed sport suspension, or you have the adaptive suspension. And both test vehicles are equipped with the adaptive suspension today, so we can even better compare the driving part. In the rear, I think they work both very well design-wise. The X3, since the most recent facelift, has these new three-dimensional tail lamps here with a nice signature, I think a beautiful job. Lower part with the M Sport Pack with the black contrast and real exhaust tips. So no job for the Autogefühl fake exhaust police for today because here there's just no fake exhaust tip at all. It's hidden underneath and that's also way to go. And once again, M Sport with a similar insert and here the different signature. Yeah, I think here it's just a matter of preference, but both very beautiful in the design. Or what do you think? Tell me in the comments. Turning indicators, however, this year is a clear win for the X3. Key fob comparison is the X1 here, the newer one, more high gloss black, a little bit more modern. In here the more classic old school X3. Which one would you take? As for me, yeah, I know, real buttons, straightforward here and no high gloss black the buttons are here at the side so for me it's that one let's get to the interior of the x1 here we have flush door handles but they still have the normal manual opening and here also a feedback i think that's a good compromise between looks aerodynamics and still having this classic feedback of a door handle door closing sound definitely solid and instant of the doors high grade leatherette sensor tech and here this beige trim i love that color especially with the blue exterior and then this beige or oyster interior it's pretty cool different colors are available also brown or black and this is all the viganza material so this new bmw leatherette high grade you can see you have it in the completely 
shiny part, let's call it that way, and the perforated part for a better ventilation while seating a passive one. Let's get inside and you already have a nice entry. It is basically, yeah, it's, it feels like a grown-up SUV, although it's the smaller one here and you have great comfort. It's really soft and headroom here with one A9602 without a panoramic roof, no problem at all, even with a panoramic roof. You would get along as a tall person. Steering wheel here with a manual control up and down, but really smooth in the process. And by the way, the perforated Veganza is the sport seat. There is also a base seat with fabric available, then without that shoulder support here. The interior cockpit overview in the X1 is cleaner and more modern here with this integrated curved screen. Two individual screens on there then, and you don't have this iDrive controller here. I'm missing that definitely but then again it looks cleaner but yeah to reach to the touchscreen to me not ideal what's beautiful here the sensor take a dashboard very good quality overall the build quality of this vehicle is outstanding especially for this segment digital instruments clear modern nice to read i think this is just a matter of preference if you prefer the one x3 or here x1 and you can see it's a very good display nice wide integration this is the bmw menu a little bit overloaded, I think, but you get along when you know which ones you really, really need. And here on the left side, you always have hotkeys and the temperature always here or the climate menu where you control the seat heating. To me, a little bit too complicated. You have all functions, but I don't want to do that while driving. And you see this integrated shifting lever. You have less typical BMW sport feeling, but then again, it's really clean and integrated. However, we still have a manual volume jog here. Cup holders are not adaptive. That's hit and miss, definitely. Bottles fly around, but here that's cool. This is the seat belt for your smartphone. You can secure it like this, and behind it is an inductive charging pad, and it's actually also cooled that it doesn't overheat. Rear seats, nice design there in the middle console, two USB-C chargers. Let's get inside. We have the same nice seat materials, looks pretty amazing. Inside of the door seat is hard pack in the rear, but it has a nice structure, so it doesn't look hard pack actually. Hmm. And then it's soft touch here with the sensor tech material at the inside of the doors. Harman Kardon sound system also in the rear. And well, you have this recess here in the seat, but it needs to be a little bit higher that the recess really fits for the knees very well. So for tall adults in the rear, when tall adults are driving, Kind of a problem here in the X1, not the best. Headroom is no problem at all. And the seat comfort is also very good. Yeah, again, this seat needs to be a little bit higher than it would also work for me, but I usually have the seat in the lowest position then. In the middle seat here, works too as for my height, also from the comfort, just again, this legroom thing. Yeah, it's a shorter SUV and you do feel that here. However, you can also adjust the back part here of the seat. That's good. And also from the build quality. And this here plug-in hybrid model, when you have a pure combustion engine X1, then you can also get the movable bench by 13 centimeters or five inches front and back. And yeah, this helps to be a little bit more flexible. However, the plug-in hybrid bench is not higher. Interior of the X3 now. First of all, door closing sound. It's actually good as well, but I feel the X1 was even better there. Then inside of the doors, also the sensor tech. A little bit harder, I feel, though. Galvanization of the buttons here for the window leader is nice, but make no mistake, this is a 100 euro extra, and that can't be that they make so many extra options. Hmm. Then the interior, a little bit more classic, traditional setup. Also buttons on the steering wheel, same for both. Seats here, also sensor tech, available in different colors. Perforation as well, so this has been introduced with the facelift. However, the material is very good already, yes, but the Veganza in the X1 is a little bit softer than this one here. When you get inside, the seating position is kind of different, yes. You sit a little bit higher, you have a more grown-up SUV feeling, but then again, the seat ergonomics, like off the seat itself, is better in the X1, together with a more soft material that adapts more to your body. So you have a somewhat more cooler command driving position from the general feeling, but then again, the seating comfort is definitely better in the X1. Here, of course, you also have a lot of headroom with 189 or 6 for 2. In here, a cockpit overview of the BMW X3, the bigger one. Same as 
also real buttons on the steering wheel but then here we still have a manual climate unit that's a better user interface i feel screens they are separated in digital instruments and the main infotainment unit and the base version starts smaller and here the optional or higher trim solutions then the screens are a little bit bigger than in the x1 the digital instruments ooh, they have here the old styling but i mean I also like it, so that's personal preference. I would say both do the job. Infotainment system is here the OS 7, so the older version. On the one hand, it's easier. Also here on the left side, you can see this is then the car menu where I have the driving information pretty quickly available. That is better, I think. And you can also see I can also control it from below because I still have this lower control unit. So both pro and con. Apple CarPlay integration also works very well. The thing is that here it sometimes is a little bit slower and fails a little bit more often with the wireless connection. But that's you know, one advantage of the OS 8 where it's quicker and more reliable. Here is lower middle console. Yeah, I just like to control down here. So while driving it's easier and also the real shifting lever in the X3. It takes more space. It also stands out. Yeah, I know what you're thinking, but I just <laughs> think it's a little bit better to have this feeling, this connection to the vehicle. And then in the front part, here the... Okay, that happened. Interesting. Hmm. That's not that good. I get a, kind of get stuck here. Here the cup holders. That is better. They are adaptive. That's better than in the X1 and the inductive charging pad. X3 in here in the rear. A stronger middle tunnel because of the rear wheel drive platform inside of the doors here with a soft touch sensor tech. So that's a little bit better, I would say. But what about the space and the legroom and so on? Shoe tab, of course. Signature auto gefühl move. Yeah, I mean, here the seat itself is a little bit higher by default, so you have more space for your feet, even though when the seat is in the lowest position, and then also fits well with the recess. So let's say a, maybe a little bit better, but it's more about the height. So if you put the X1 driver seat a little bit higher, it's more or less comparable here, maybe a little bit more. So, but not that it would justify the length of the car it has additionally room no problem at all and in the middle seat is it comparable yes you have this bigger tunnel here as i said you can also sit here so um yeah the rear space a little bit better here with the x3 but not the largest difference is the difference then in the trunk now it's time for the big trunk comparison or is it big <laughs> that's cool right so let's start here with the x1 and the main thing for me here is, is there a length difference? And now what you're thinking, here <laughs> there is almost 90 centimeters or 35 inches. 490 liters here, also for the plug-in hybrid. You have some more space underneath, for example, for the charging cable. And then 450 liters for the X3 in this plug-in hybrid version. Although here, I remember this step also from the US spec version from pure petrol engine to put replacement tire underneath. And yeah, liter figure wise, a little bit limited. And now the astonishing thing is when you measure here the standard trunk length, it is less than 90 centimeters or 35 inches, especially with that step here. So yeah, charging cable needs to be put on top, no space underneath here. So that's astonishing, right? I mean, it's really the way longer vehicle here with the X3, but the rear space just a little bit longer, trunk even a little bit shorter. Yeah. It's all about that this one just has the longer hood. Engine comparison. I just love that shot. <laughs> so very interesting. Two liter four cylinder petrol and diesel for both. But then on the lower end, a 1.5 liter three cylinder for the X1. The plug-in hybrid is also based on that. And on the other side, the X3 here with the longer hood houses also six cylinder engines, especially for the performance models. Today, it's both about the plug-in hybrid interesting thing is here that the battery is bigger with the x1 so higher electric range for the x1 welcome to thomas's comparison driving lounge we're starting with the bmw x1 in this case with the plug-in hybrid 30e what you immediately realize is when you go off the throttle you always or most of the time have some kind of recuperation it is however also adaptive here in that standard mode so for example when there's no one in front of me the car is just rolling and I don't see any recuperation inside the city when the car is in front of me. 
I go off the throttle and it does directly go into re the regenerative braking and it does decelerate, although you're just leaving your foot off the throttle like in an electric vehicle, for example. This is really good to know, but this adaptive system, it's not that you know predictable in a way, that's the con side, but then again, it helps to adapt to the situation. My modes, I can pick the sport mode, a little bit more complicated than it used to be, I would say, and you can also go to the S shifting mode and then we can accelerate from 50 kilometers now to let's see. And then we have to stop for a moment because there's a car next to us. We have to overtake then on the left lane. In the US we could overtake on the right side, but we can't do it here in Germany. Unlimited speed is possible then here on this motorway when the traffic allows it. And when we're already at speed here at 115 kilometers an hour, let's go. One fifty. and 170 kilometers an hour. So pretty good in the acceleration in the whole X1 lineup. This plug-in hybrid here is one of the quickest with 5.7 seconds to one kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. The iX1 is just a little quicker, 5.6, and the quickest then will be the M350i, the two liter four cylinder tuned to this M performance model, so to speak. Here the plug-in hybrid has the 1.5 liter three-cylinder. You maybe heard that, did you? Tell me in the comments. And it sounds somehow sportier and cooler than the four-cylinder. I'm always skeptical, however, with the three-cylinder engines because they decrease the, um, you know, the CCM, so they decrease the displacement. Then put up the horsepower figure to total system output with the electric motor, of course, 330 horsepower. And I'm always more a fan of more liters in a higher displacement, but less horsepower, so the engine is not that tuned that much. But it delivers, definitely, and when you really hit the throttle, you feel that in the first moment you get some kind of electric boost. This is, by the way, always available, the electric boost, even if the battery is depleted, because they always keep some kind of a buffer that the electric boost is always available. You can also pull this left shifting lever so even when you are, for example, not in the sport mode and also here now in the normal personal mode, then the design changes, that's pretty cool, spectacular. You can pull this lever here and then you get to the sport boost mode and you basically have the same experience than we just had. So this is also some kind of shortcut when you don't want to switch through the modes and whoa, that is quick, you know. We were already driving 150 kilometers an hour. It does well here on the German Autobahn. Wind noise is here at 160 kilometers now, pick up here a little bit there, but I mean, this is on a very high level. It's in general a pretty silent vehicle. And it also feels so well and planted. So you do get a grown up SUV feeling, although it's the smallest SUV in the BMW lineup. We have the adaptive suspension here. So it's also a little bit stiffer in the sport mode and 19 inch wheels. So we have a good sporty feeling here, lane change at higher speeds. Such a good test here. It's really a lot of fun. The steering here is pretty crisp and precise. More precise than in the BMW 3 Series, actually. And I have no idea why the steering feeling in the BMW SUVs is better than in the should-to-be benchmark 3 Series sedan. Yeah, I talked about that to BMW and I hope they will increase it or, or improve it for the next 3 Series um, overhaul. We'll of course keep you updated with that. One more acceleration here, so you have more than enough power with this plug-in hybrid here, no doubt about that, and also a lot of driving fun. This compact dimension, that speaks for the X1 also in driving. I will expect, from my experience, that the X1 is more fun to drive. At least that's what I think right now. When we soon hop over to the X3, we will of course testify that. Or, oh, you seen that? Here, this personal driving mode, it does not hop back to the menu where I was before. So we always have to then, for example, go back or go back to the GPS again. That's something I think they need to improve then with the next software version. The OS 9 will also be available soon. When you watch this video at the production date, soon also in the X1, also retrofitted to other X1. Or then already in the X1 when you watch this video, maybe a year later 
or something like that. You know, decreasing the speed, then we have recuperation. That's, of course, a good thing with the plug-in hybrid. So we can use the recuperation, yes, but the big question is also with the plug-in hybrids here, does it make sense in a way of built-in hybrids like a Toyota system or something? No, it does not. So when the battery is depleted like now, it just gives you like a seven liters on one kilometers consumption. So 35 mbg US, 40 mbg UK, and that's nothing special. It does not help so much with low fuel economy, you know. So yeah, that's not what the system is meant for. This is meant to be charged. Then it makes sense that you can drive electric inside the city and so on. So this is the use of this plug-in hybrid, but do not expect to drive it empty and then have a great fuel efficiency gain like in a built-in hybrid system, as I said, like from like Toyota system is different emphasis definitely. Here now, switching the motorway, so cool here with the steering, the sporty design and the feel of it. I really feel immediately at home in this vehicle, that's the cool thing. Look at that Kia Rio, and that, that generation. That design should be forbidden, right? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes I also can be like, I always try to be very objective, you know, but sometimes in these cases I can also be like, but I mean, modern Kia design is really awesome and in some ways they're even overtaking the Germans, we've also seen that. Now, once again, let's try this boost mode one time. Wow, 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 wow. This is giving me the boost indeed. Pretty impressive. I mean, you look at that beak from the outside and it doesn't look that sporty what it delivers, you know. Wow, that's pretty good. And the sport boost stays actually still in there. And now we're almost uh, 190 now. So almost 200 kilometers an hour, almost 125 miles an hour. And it still delivers a very good and calm job here. Yeah, really good. I can still control it very well. And here the 19 inch wheels and the adaptive suspension sitting on the sport note does a very good job indeed. So I have to say, however, here, when the road is even, great, awesome, I love that. But when the road is not that even, I'm not the biggest fan of that. So what I would advise is to go with smaller wheels if you want better everyday comfort. Maximum 18 wheels, 18 inch wheels for this vehicle, I would say, because you just profit so much more when you have more rolling comfort in your everyday driving life when you pick smaller wheels. And then when you think about, hey, I want to configure an X1 and don't spend so much money, like this test vehicle here, 66,000 euros, all the bells and whistles, then you might as well also stick with the base suspension. And when you have the base suspension, it's even more important not to go for the biggest wheels to keep the driving comfort. So always have to keep that in mind. Yeah, but definitely it feels really at home on the motorway as well. But also in the city, of course, if you compare X1 with X3, you just find a better parking space inside the city. You have, you know, smaller turning circle and so on. You can enjoy this car more in the city. You get less stress, especially in narrow European cities. For the US, maybe not that relevant, but for Europe, it is actually very relevant. Therefore, a lot of people, especially in the European cities, rather go for the X1. But the question is, when we directly hop over to the X3 now, how does it feel in driving? This extra in price and size, is it justified? Is it so much more sophisticated? Or is the X1 just right enough? Now let's switch to the X3, also in the 30E version. Go to the sport mode, also combine both powertrains and start from 60 kilometers an hour. Let's go. One twenty. That's one forty. So, also, let's say decently quick, but not as quick as the S one. S one. <laughs> it's not an Audi. As the X one. <laughs> so the X one plug-in hybrid was five point seven seconds. This one here is six point one seconds in the acceleration figure. And let's just accelerate further. Now there we are, some more power boost from that engine. Here, a two liter force in the engine. So yeah, we also hear and feel that more displacement here in these higher 
speed regions, more as having 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. Yeah, and it feels so stable on the road here with the M Sportback, adaptive suspension, a little bit stiffer in the sport mode, top speed here, 214 kilometers an hour, so like 130, 135 miles an hour. Wow, feels really good high speed as well, and also noise insulation wise, good job. 20 inch wheels we have mounted here. We do feel when the road is even, it's fine, but you do feel some bumps notably. So similar what is 19 to the X1, 20 is for the X3, of course, bigger segment, and then they also allow bigger wheels. But for both, I would go at least one size below that to give you just more comfort in driving. It drives super well. Also, you know, here when going left and right and so on, but then again, just rolling comfort when the road is not that good. 20 inch is just a little bit too much. But the suspension is doing a good job. Love the adaptive suspension by BMW. Same suspension setups, possible base or fixed sport or the adaptive suspension. So that is kind of similar with both vehicles. Of course, different platform, different technology a little bit. Steering wise, I have a better feeling in the X1 because here in the X3, I would say it feels a little bit less natural in a way. So here it's kind of like a little bit more dead, but then when you go a little bit more to the side, then it suddenly becomes a little bit too hectic, you know? So I feel the steering is not that well balanced here as it is in the X1. So definitely prefer the X1 steering as for the whole feeling how you feel connected to the vehicle. We can also go back to the normal hybrid mode and we also hear less sound pronunciation. Part of that is also artificial. Basically all manufacturers use that meanwhile, but you can still accelerate in this hybrid mode then goes all the way through. Let's do a high speed lane change as well. Well done. Keeps really, really calm. You feel that you sit a little bit higher in the X3. It feels a little bit more sophisticated as for the driving position. It feels more SUV even than the X1. So this is something that is definitely pro X3. On the other hand, you feel the size and the weight that the X1 is just a little bit more agile, especially than in tight corners. And then the question is, what is more important to you actually? So all times also go back to the sport mode and the sport mode we always have this kind of rpm preload goes gear lower and so on we also have the combined power of both drivetrains here difference in all electric driving so what is possible on the maximum scale the x3 a little bit older overall vehicle has less capacity in the battery here in the plug-in hybrid version so something like 40 kilometers of pure electric range 25 miles whereas the x1 more like 60 kilometers of pure electric range like 40 miles so the x1 has an advantage there definitely the x3 however it is a real biased platform that's what i like about the x3 when you accelerate out of the corners although this one here from the whole chassis and so on feels less sporty than the x1 because it's just bigger more weight and so on and the handling overall is more fun with the X1. So I think that you have more fun definitely with the X1, yes, however, just in the case of accelerating out of the corners and we will soon do it here when we switch the autobahn, so accelerating out is better with the X3 because of this rear wheel bias, even if you have done an all wheel drive version. Because when you have more power on the rear wheels it kind of helps you swinging out of the corner so to speak the rear axle overtakes the front axle you know, not that extreme of course we don't drift or something but just that you can imagine why it kind of feels sportier than with the rear axle bias yeah, we'll do that one here nice lane change yeah it is also fun it is a fun suv it is a driver's suv also, if you compare it to other ones, but oh, here now, also in the corner, the steering feel is just a little bit off. It's like a little bit like in the BMW 3 Series, must have been to do like with the platforms. They also use the same steering wheel for that. Accelerating Audi now is cool. The engine gives me a little bit more livelihood than the one, than that three cylinder in the X1. 
of course, the 2 liter Forsen is also available for the X1, just not for the plug-in hybrid. So that is actually cool. You do have fun with it. But I really have to say, yes, driving straight. So imagine you have long routes where you just drive straight. Then maybe like this more sophisticated high position might help you. Just go back to the normal hybrid mode here. Just keep it a little bit calmer. But as soon as you go a little bit in corners, the X1 is just more fun. Steering input wise, the whole handling, a little bit lower position, it gives you more, mm, let's say, more, more, a more safe controlled feeling, I would also say. It's not that this one is not not safe or not controllable, just in a direct comparison. The X1, you feel more one with the vehicle in the X1 and in the X3. It's good, definitely also to the brand outside competitors, but brand internal comparison here, the X1 just gives me more fun. Another important thing is here, long-term driving comfort. These seats here already have the perforated sensor tech, which is cool, definitely, but the Veganza seats, which is kind of like an evolved sensor tech in the X1, they also give you more comfort here while driving. They are softer, they adapt more to the body. At the same time, the X1 sport seats, which most X1s are equipped with, give you actually more shoulder support here than these ones here while driving. And I'm surprised because usually the higher segment, this one here, delivers always more seating comfort, more long-term comfort. And in this case, if you ask me right now, would I drive 300 kilometers or, I don't know, like 150 miles of Autobahn, German motorway, right now with the X1 or the X3, it would be indeed the X1. And again, not because the X3 is bad in any way, just because the seat ergonomics, how they played it out and so on, is so good overall in the X1. Still, the X3 has a lot to offer. As I said, this higher seating position, you somehow get a more like better traveling feeling if you want, if you think about the road trip or something. And again, seat comfort, it might also depend on the individual body. So I recommend to visit dealer and maybe test seat in both of them. But I can just give my experience also with my height and so on. And I also love that I, while driving, can control the temperature in an easy way. So just before a corner, I'm really conf confident, I can also do the sport mode, really confident to change that. I also need just one press of a button to go to the sport mode. The X1, I need then to do press and then in the infotainment system here, one press of a button and then also, you know, here pressing up or down for changing the temperature. So with this more conservative layout, I enjoy the X3 a little bit more with this more direct, more old school interface. That is something that is also important to me while driving. However, both still have rear buttons at the steering wheel, so that is kind of equal. You're still having fun with the X3, no doubt about that in the corners. Also, you know, we, we did some GLC with X3 view, for example. Both are also very interesting SUVs. You can also check out that one later on. Yeah. So it has been a very interesting experience here in the driving part. But now the question is, if we combine all the different factors, exterior, interior, driving, technology, and pricing, why is pricing the small thing? Yeah. <laughs> Which one should you take home? Which one would I take home? Does it differ from market to market? Can I make a thinking pose and walk at the same time? That's the first question. And the second question is, which one would I take home? Can you tell me? So the BMW X1, BMW X3, they're both very successful SUVs. As I said, bestsellers at BMW. Hmm. The X1, styling wise, I'm really satisfied with it. The X3 just has this more massive SUV stance. So from the exterior look, I kind of prefer the X3. But just because, you know, I like this more bold SUV styling. This one still, for a small SUV or crossover, it does look bold, no doubt about that. Interior styling-wise, I'm all the way with the X1 from the styling. However, I do prefer the more classic traditional user interface with the X3, with the turning knob for the infotainment system, for example, with the manual climate unit. However, then again, the X1 has 
the better infotainment system as for how fast and responsive it is and also how secure and safe the connection to the smartphone is. That is actually better with the wireless connection in the OS 7 system is sometimes not that good actually. The crucial difference however in the interior is the seating comfort and they're both good and also the artificial leatherette or the man-made leather that one is a very good quality in both vehicles however even better in the x1 so it's softer and also the seat ergonomics is way better in the x1 not that the x3 would be bad the x1 just tops it and to me it's also one of the most comfortable vehicles in this segment or in this compact segment overall and that's why for the interior i would still go with the x1 because i feel the seating comfort would then be more important than the manual climate unit to me. Yeah, maybe I have to live then with 22 degrees Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit automatic. Hmm. I don't like it, but I would <laughs> live with that for the seat comfort. And then of course in driving, that was super interesting. I like the rear wheel drive or this rear wheel biased concept with the X3. Of course it does offer the possibility of a six cylinder. Then again, the X1 feels more balanced and kind of lighter in the corners and so on. It is more driving fun then overall. Yeah, fuel economy doesn't make the largest difference. The plug-in hybrid is of course the better system here in the X1, more efficient, bigger battery, no compromise in the trunk and so ever. Yeah, and then you have to think about that the size on the exterior does not represent the size difference in the interior almost same legroom in the rear the x3 just a little bit longer trunk wise the x1 is even a little bit longer at least in the plug-in hybrid versions as well so there is no huge advantage you get with the x3 price difference very interesting as the vehicles stand here right now with all the bells and whistles 66,000 euros and 80,000 euros so it's a 14,000 euro difference and interesting when you take off the extra options it is still the same price difference. That's the European difference. In the US, the difference is not as large. So there you don't pay so much extra for the X3. So in Europe, it's a clear choice. Go with the X1 also with the more narrow roads and so on. In the US, it's even a little bit trickier because the price difference is not as large and also have most states more open wide roads. So the X3 gets more attractive. Yeah, it's also built in the US. That's also, it's probably better or more attractive from the pricing there. Goes from the Spartanburg plant, whereas the X1 is built in Germany in Regensburg. Have you always secretly been dreaming of owning a BMW X6, but it's too expensive or maybe too large for the area you live in? Well, the all new BMW X2 is now, so to speak, a small BMW X6 and we have it in different versions, different powertrains. In this very review, we will drive the X2 M35i, the top spec in the combustion engine trim, versus the top all-wheel drive electric model, and then see how it plays out, how do they compare. Everything you need to know about this new generation with Thomas and Autogefühl in full HD. Wait a minute, we're in 4K now, in 4K? Full screen, full length, let's go with the front, which a large double kidney here, also optional with the iconic glow that is here, this illumination around the kidney. This is here also styling wise, the M performance model, the M35i of the X2. So you have this more aggressive look, a lot of high gloss black paint here. And this is also an individual BMW color. It's called Frozen Tempa Bay Green. Wow. Yeah, that is definitely screaming out, isn't it? Then the headlamps, you can see these are with these blue accentuations, the optional adaptive LED lamps. Here the daytime running light on the outside, main headlamp unit on the inside, and more sporty accentuations that would also appear when you have the M Sport package. Then here, wheels, these are 20 inch wheels. Overall, the portfolio is 17 up to 21, but these ones are look already really sporty it will be very crucial if they deliver enough comfort because suspension wise you get a base suspension or the adaptive m suspension but i have to say bmw i found it a little bit misleading calling it adaptive m because to me an adaptive suspension is always adjustable from the inside you can pick the sport mode then get stiffer you go for comfort mode and it gets softer that's not the case here actually it is adaptive in a way of 
passive adaptive. They are frequency selective dampers. That mean they react on the different impact they get, like quick or soft, and then they automatically adapt. But that means you cannot adjust it. So this one, since it is the M Performance model, does have the adaptive M suspension. And we'll tell you later when we drive the vehicle if that's fine for comfort or not. Length, 4 meters 55 or 179 inches. And that means it is actually 19 centimeters or 8 inches longer than the predecessor. It has grown massively, also slightly in wheelbase. And it's now also a little bit longer than the BMW X1 brother. 5 centimeters or 2 inches longer. But the styling, you can see the X2 has always been about this Copé styling. It's way more stretched now in this very area and a really strong hip area you can see right there. And yeah, I always love this frozen paint, especially because when you hug or pat the vehicle, you can hear that actually. <laughs> Look at that aggressive rear here, of course, when you have an M Sport package or the M Performance model, then it's even more aggressive, especially with the black accentuations in the lower part here with the diffuser style. And then real exhaust, I mean, massive. This is still a two liter four cylinder engine and that looks like a V8 or something, doesn't it? They are real. Then the new graphic for the tail lamps, like really, you know, technology style i would call that way so not smooth at all and then here the m35i has this huge rear wing that is also once again having that black contrast would you prefer rather a more subtle version or do you like here the m35i style tell me in the comments by the way aerodynamics has also been improved now at 0.25 in the cd value, CD value and also I mean, that's quite obvious, especially if Leah comes around like here, like, like this really stay straight view here. The track is also wider now, and that gives you a bigger stance on the road and probably also more driving dynamics. We'll find out very soon. Ooh, turning in here, look at that, how they replace the data run light, and they also have this pulsing effect like a heartbeat. Some actually do like that, but I've also read comments that some find this pulsing effect rather weird. What do you think? And in the rear, the indicators replace a part of the light. Quite fancy, isn't it? As for the engine lineup, this is the top spec 2 liter 4 cylinder. Here also with the separate dome strut M badge on there for the M. 35i. This one here, 300 horsepower in Europe, 317 horsepower on the Northern American market, 5.4 seconds in the acceleration figure, and all-wheel drive. There's like front plus rear on demand. This is the quickest model out there, the most powerful one. The next in line would actually be the iX2, the all-electric version, at 5.6 seconds in the acceleration figure powered by a 65 kilowatt hour battery that's not too large in the electric segment overall, you have to say. Other combustion engine versions would be a 2 liter 4 cylinder diesel or a weaker petrol engine, a 3 cylinder 1.5 liter turbo petrol engine if you want it a little bit more affordable. And very interesting, whereas in Europe they leave an engine gap between the 1.5 liter 3 cylinder and the X2 M35i in the US you can also get the 28i. This is also then a 2 liter 4 cylinder with 245 horsepower, 6.5 seconds in the acceleration figure. So that gap is filled. But actually, in the US, that is then the entry level petrol engine, whereas the 1.5 liter 3 cylinder is not available there. That is then the entry level engine in the European market. This one here, by the way, also an M35i, but here in frozen Portimao blue. Also a matte color, also one of my favorite ones. It looks so striking. Also then here once again with the super large wheels. These ones are the biggest ones, 21. So an even more striking look. Tell me in the comments which color would you pick today actually. Maybe you've seen it or maybe you wondered. This is here a BMW CE02 or 02 and it's an electric motorcycle, electric scooter in a motorcycle style. So they're doing that meanwhile as well. Maybe some of you know that I also have a motorcycle background. I actually started driving motorcycles before I was driving cars because I was starting to ride motocross when I was, I think, 13 or something. 
Um, yeah, and then also uh, motorcycles on the street and so on. There is actually one, like one or two reviews of motorcycles also on our channel, but of course we haven't, you know, like invested much in that. It's usually all about cars here on Autogefühl. <laughs> Today, when I open it here with the key, there you can see how the illumination of the front double kidney comes to life. So this is the iX2 electric version. There's a front-wheel driven or an all-wheel driven electric version available. The all-wheel drive one and the second quickest one behind the M35i. And you can see here the inlet of this grille is different. This is an all the way closed. So this is basically the only electric look and the blue ring around the BMW logo. Other than that, this one is also equipped with the M Sport Pack. And that's why we also have the black accentuations in the lower part. And this is one of my favorite colors at BMW overall. This is Brooklyn Gray. And it just looks amazing no matter if you go for a sedan or for an SUV. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now taking the bets. Is there a frunk or is there none? Du -du. No, this is also not something you can push up. There is no frunk actually. Hmm. Yeah. But there's wiper fluid, at least. <laughs> Key fob here with M colors in the M performance version. Flush door handles, but they still give you a haptic feedback to open and close, by the way. You hold your hand right here, then it closes, or you put your hand underneath, then it opens with this keyless function. Then door closing sound <sighs> is okay, nothing special, I have to say. Then inside, this is soft touch. Then here we have a microfiber version. Different versions are available. What's cool here from the optional Harman Kardon sound system, this speaker design, soft touch also here. But then hardback here and there's also no inside covering so there's no felt or whatsoever. Then this one being the M35i also gets the M Sport steering wheel with the contrast stitches on the inside that looks pretty fancy. Oh and also these shifting pedals here with plus and minus that's cool. Then the seats they are sport seats or comfort seats in general you have fabric available you have a high-grade leather red available, for example. This one, however, is then the sports with the microfiber. So these come also with the integrated head restraint. And then here on the top part, you can see it is like this perforated microfiber and the colors of the M badge here, these different three colors, they shine through this perforation. That is a lovely job indeed. So the high-grade leather red is also very soft so-called Veganza material. And here, so with the microfiber, well, the spot is actually quite firm. Um, so far, so good. But I think the softest version would indeed be the hybrid leather red version, if you want like the best seating comfort in, in that respect. Steering wheel with manual control, up and down, in and out. And also the whole process is also pretty smooth. I like that. And on the steering wheel, you still have real buttons to set the cruise control, for example, or here for the volume. I really prefer to have that. And interesting for all European viewers here, there is this secret hotkey, which no one should know about, to cancel these speed warnings every time, you know, when you're going like one kilometer an hour, just too, too quick and like bing, bing, bing. Press and hold the set button, then it's deactivated. Then I'm mentioning it in that review might also lead to the regulators uh, disallowing that. But at least when you have that vehicle here, then you know how to deactivate it when you have just bought it. And headroom here without a panoramic roof, really a lot left with 189.62. Interior cockpit overview, 10.25 on the left, 10.7 screen on the right. Here, also with the microfiber inset as a deco element, but different deco elements available here as well. The vents are still controlled manually and the steering wheel from this perspective again you see the sportiness here for example also with the 12 o'clock marking in the lower part. That's very interesting. You basically have a seat belt for your smartphone because there's the inductive charging pad and then it's being held tight and also on the back part there are cooling holes that it doesn't overheat. Just see the cup holders they are not adaptive and then this is happening, so yeah, they need to fix this. Flying middle console with space underneath, and on the console you have the shifting lever, 
reverse drive mode and for example here you can click for the driving modes glad to still at least have the manual volume jog and i wondered what am i supposed to put in here well obviously not a smartphone maybe a handkerchief so the driving mode selection you have to press in the middle console and then you have to switch and press in the screen to access the sport mode but then this screen is staying for example then if you want to switch back to the gps you have to press nav again then you're back here for example at this navigation system this is the car internal one you can see it's actually quite responsive this is os <laughs> <laughs> this is because the car has turned it itself off now to save the battery. This is OS 9 now actually, so a new software version for that. And we, for example, also have Apple CarPlay. There's a hotkey here in the lower part. There we go. This is the CarPlay integration. The Harman Kardon sound system, by the way, is pretty decent. Hmm. That's a good, rich sound indeed. Uh, very three-dimensional as well. So like that and the rest of the BMW internal Jeep uh, system here. So this is then the main menu with all the apps. And I think once again, it's just an app overload. Like where am I supposed to find what? Live vehicle is always um, good for like consumption and so on. Digital instruments, when the car is running, you can always select the content you want to see, but you can also switch the whole layout of that system here, for example, this more classic view like this, or then this uh, yeah, half view maybe. And one of my favorite features is always that when you have Apple Maps in Apple CarPlay, you can also have it here, the view in the instruments. BMW is the only manufacturer to offer that so far, at least what I have seen, and really with the map integration. That works with Google Maps when you have Android Auto, but Google Maps in Apple CarPlay, that combination does not work like here. And there's also a head-up display. It's a real one projected into the windscreen. Now to the rear compartment. First of all, rear door closing sound. I would say it's okay, nothing special. But what's special is that even in the rear doors, we have here the soft covering here, then also these microfiber inserts in the M-Performance version, softer here, just in the very low part. It's hard pack. And then we also have the microfiber version then for the rear seats. It's being said, well, it's not being said, it's fact that it actually has a longer wheelbase, but does that translate into more legroom than before? So before we hardly had any legroom in the X2. Now it's not abundant, but you see here, when I put my knees in this recess, then it works with tall adults, even if a tall adult is driving. These sports seats, of course, are very voluminous as well. So, um, yeah, but then you have to put your knees like this a little bit like this would not work that well. And headroom exactly fits with 189, a six for two, that's really close, but works. Yeah, but overall the comfort is actually quite fine. Then you can also fold the seats from here. You have to do it from here with these straps here. And then you can also see here, yeah, put it a little bit more upright or fold down completely. And you can also do the same with this middle part here for a ski hatch or pull this one down. Then you have adaptive cup holders here. And in the middle console, you have two USB-C chargers. Is it also possible that I sit on the middle part? Oh, these rear floor mats, they fly around easily as well. So middle part sitting is, phew, that is close in every respect. So not to be recommended, rather for four. To open the hatch here, we have to flip the logo. That looks quite fancy, doesn't it? And now let's imagine you're discussing at home if you go for the all electric version, the three cylinder mild hybrid, or here the top performance version. You could say, wait a minute, the M35i has the lar largest luggage volume with 560 liters, 90 liters more than before, with a meter of 40 inches. The length here, slightly less, like 90 centimeters or 35 inches, so well usable. And you can see when I get out the luggage, then you can also see the difference because here, this one doesn't have a battery in the rear, so there is much space underneath the left. Look at that. And here, this is a cool feature. Have you seen that? It stays up here, so you can easily load everything in here and then put it down again. So this is a very good solution. And you can also fold the seats individually there, like one, one, one. 
And how could you see it's an EV? Well, here the blue ring around the logo and in the trunk, there's a small difference actually. The cool thing is that on top, there's no difference here from the depth and so on. But just when you put this one up, then you have here space for a charging cable. And this space is kind of missing here. So what you see here is actually not part of the battery. It's part of the drivetrain unit for the rear axle that sits underneath here and is taking the space. Then second interior for today. This is the EV, but this is not connected. You can get this interior here for all BMW X2 versions. And these here are the black Veganza seats. So it's the high-grade leatherette material, also with perforation. And usually the fabric or the microfiber is softer. But in this case here, actually, the surface is softer. And I have to say that this seat then here is more comfortable than the microfiber seat we have in the M350i. But you can go for this one here also in other versions and so on. Um, so I think I would actually prefer this one here overall than as the best solution. And on the dashboard, you have this structure in here. It's also soft touch, but you know, also pretty cool. Welcome to Thomas's active driving lounge with the BMW X2 M35i. My mode, clicking here, sport mode here. If I want to use the launch control, please don't repeat, not on public roads. Here, driving dynamics, sport to sport plus. Then it's also possible for the launch control mode. I can also put here to the S shifting mode. Now I'm done. And when I now hit the brake pedal with my left foot and the accelerator pedal with my right foot, this happens. There we go. That went quick. The only thing is that when I have the launch control active, then you cannot see that speed in the middle part. So that's a little bit irritating, at least you know, to, to you as a viewer. So yeah, maybe that you can see the speed. I'll just slow down a little bit and make like this, uh, this rolling start. Then you can see how you know, speed and how quickly it accelerates. So let's go again. There we go, that was 290. Yeah, you, you heard the Lea meter was also active somewhat. And now, wow, this is what this car is doing best. Driving sporty, it's compact, it's light in comparison to other bigger SUVs and so on. Wow, the steering here gives me good feeling, way better, for example, in the BMW 3 Series. Good feeling for the whole vehicle. I know exactly what it's doing. Yes, it is always a front wheel bias, but there were also power sent to the rear wheels. And it feels so balanced. Suspension really sporty and stiff. Wow, really precise out of the corners as well. Nice sound. It's of course enhanced here from the speakers on the inside. But on a dynamic scale here, this is awesome. Adaptive M suspension here, which is, as I said earlier, not adaptive in the sense that they can change it in the, in the screen. And yeah, I'm easily catching up to the Porsche there in front of me. Of course, yeah, he's not, not driving that fast. Yeah, I mean, the suspension is very stiff, but here the road is quite good, so that's fine. That's a lot of fun and pretty cool. And yeah, the overall setup, I mean, you don't feel that you would be driving. I mean, I would rather feel driving like this one there in front of me. It's making space or what? Seems like. Probably wants to do some enjoy ride just with open top. Wow, overtaking process, a lot of fun. This is awesome. Again, the 20 inch wheels, suspension combo, really sporty and stiff, but for that here, it's ideal to do that. <laughs> Woo, yeah, but yeah, you feel that when now it's getting bumpy, and there it almost feels like you are being in an F1 car or something. So uh, it will be really interesting, of course, how it will perform when we uh, measure the comfort and stuff. But wow, the sporty side is just amazing. And also, if you compare the predecessor, this one here feels even sporty, although it is longer and has a slightly longer wheelbase. Oh, maybe heard that a little bit um, pre revving the vehicle or rev matching. But you can also use here the shifting pedals yourself, shifting up, shifting down. That's also a lot of fun. But I actually feel, I mean, the shifting pedals, they don't give you the best or most crucial feedback. I would say more feedback indeed you get from the turning indicators. 
that is a lot of fun. So to me, the turning indicators is yeah, one of the most fun things. You know, there is this meme that people always say BMW drivers don't hit the turning indicators. I'm not sure if it's true or not, but there is this, you know, like this prejudice outside, uh, out there. But the thing is, probably they made like, hey, you know, let's just make turning indicators so much fun that people will use them always, you know. And um, I can just stress that using the turning indicator here is so much fun, just really rocks. <laughs> well, and if you go back here, personal mode, normal shifting mode and so on, everything is really calmed down, more silent, then you can enjoy also these curvy bends in a calm style and I, I really love that. So also just in normal driving mode here, the steering feedback is a little bit different but still fine. The suspension, as I said, does not change and as I said here, as long as the roads are really well done and nice and smooth, it's really all fine. But when it gets bumpy, whew, then you, you saw that on, you know, on one part of the road already. When you have bumpy roads, it really gets very uncomfortable. So and I would have wished a little bit more of both, you know, sportiness and comfort at the same time. But that's not happening here. So especially if you go here for the all new X2 with the M Sport suspension, or if you are with the M Performance model here, you have to be aware of it is a very sporty vehicle and you will lose comfort. What could you do? Go for base spec, don't go for the M suspension, get smaller wheels. These are the main things you could actually do. The iX2 is also equipped with the adaptive M suspension and with the, the, you know, the lowered body. So these ones here, sporty and the EV version, always have that, you know, that, that lowered suspension to give you a little bit more sportiness with the electric version because of the weight mainly. So it is so much fun, yes, definitely. But you always have to keep everyday comfort in mind. It is very silent though, you know, so the insulation for a compact vehicle is actually quite nice. And you have good overview still. So seating really depends on the materials and the sport or comfort seat if you pick. But that is the main thing with this vehicle. So about the suspension and the wheels, you really majorly decide from version to version or from trim to trim how sporty or how comfortable you set this vehicle. And now, here more motorway-esque road, also a little bit quicker, and cruise control set here also with the active lane keeping assist. You can see very smooth movements, of course, still level two, so you're supposed to keep your hands on the steering wheel. That's also very well done. And from the rolling noise and wind noise here at about 80 kilometers an hour, is also well done and quite silent. And acceleration of the iX2, officially just 0.2 seconds difference. Let's see how it turns out here. <laughs> Plop, that's 90. Woo! I heard the Lea meter was going a little bit further this time <laughs> in the electric version. I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's weird, right? Uh, the M. 35i, it sounds of course more extreme in a way, but here it felt quicker, right? Yeah. yeah. Although it, it is not really quicker, you know, at least on paper. Maybe we, we check the time codes, but it should be but more the or less. Boost is like... Yeah, the, I think it's especially because the electric boost is like from the get go, you know, and then the combustion engine catches up. Um, but like from, from zero, like sprinting forward, that's why you have the instant torque. So Performance-wise, it is not lacking anything here. There is this all-wheel drive version for the electric drivetrain, then there's the front-wheel drive version only with a little bit less power, of course. That is possible too. Yeah, but here in the all-wheel drive version, definitely I can say equal power. And it's also a lot of fun. It has the more or less same suspension. They didn't tune it to the very stiff mode they did for the M. 35i so here they draw the suspension let's say a little bit back so they already have the adaptive amp suspension here both front axle with the frequency adaptive dampers not to be adjusted here but then again they didn't go to the sportiest extent and we have 20 inch wheels mounted here and i feel there is indeed a slight difference so as i would say that the m performance model really too rough 
yeah, if you were going over some bumps here, it is still a notable stiff suspension, yes. But I feel that it's not that extreme, actually. What do you, what, what do you say? Difference? Mm, yeah. You feel it too? Yeah. So that's really interesting. So for the M Performance model, I would have said it's just too stiff for everyday driving. Then at least maybe go 19 inch wheels or something. Or go for the, then the base suspension, not for the X, uh, X2 M35i. But here in the electric version, I think it's still fine. It might also have to do with, think about there is added weight here due to the battery and then of course when you have more weight it kind of automatically puts more pressure on the dampers which could be better than for the comfort in this case you know what I mean from the driving agility low center of gravity also with the battery and it's really cool so yeah the 35i feels maybe a little bit more engaging but here is also really nice and agile you could Wow, out of the corners really quickly. That instant torque is something also where I could say accelerating out kind of feels even sportier. Of course, this sensation of sound is stronger with the M3, M35i. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> sorry about it. It's a very complicated name, isn't it? But here, wow, that instant torque is, is really sensational. Wow really cool so you can have at least as much fun here with the electric version oh you can see here from the gps also this augmented reality camera view two more things ev related first of all to the recuperation so either you have the adaptive recuperation mode and that means when i lift my foot off the throttle and there's no one in front of me then the car is just rolling there's no regenerative braking however when i get closer to a vehicle in front of me then there is recuperation and I really feel that. The good thing is it is adaptive according to the situation. The bad thing is not as predictable. Here, for example, now there's strong recuperation. I didn't use the brakes and it's just adaptive. When I was freeway, nothing at all. To make it predictable and always hard regenerate, re regenerative braking, sorry about that, <laughs> then here you go here to the B mode using the shifting pedal and then lift my throttle foot here off then it's always hard recuperation actually and this is more predictable then again it might put some more stress on the passenger <laughs> so uh, this is always the thing to consider with electric you have to be really gentle with your foot with recuperation with the brake pedal itself this is also kind of hard because this brake blending is not working perfectly so i'm slightly on the brake pedal, not much is happening when the real brakes set in then it's a stronger braking, so you also need to get a feeling for that. When you're here in the driving settings, you have to know that you can still click this one and then go deep in the menu and switch from adaptive to low, moderate or high. And then it stays at, for example, a low recuperation level. However, it's always being reset again when you start the vehicle the next time. Second thing I want to talk about is here when I put these driving mode selection, oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a driving mode selection here and the second button for driving settings and here I can deactivate or activate iconic sounds and especially in the sport mode you heard it earlier when I'm in the sport mode here so but I can also just turn it off like here and then there's when I'm on the throttle nothing completely silent so you can choose that if you want to have that or not I think it's good that you have the choice because some might find it cool some might just find it annoying so that's about the EV specific facts but I have to say overall what is trim related what is powertrain related trim related that these seats here are more comfortable so go for these Veganza seats here also you know in favor of the microfiber seats for example they are here just most comfortable seat form and also from the surface and then suspension here is a little bit better in the EV version. It might be also better or good in the diesel or in the smaller petrol engine. Cannot comment on that yet. But definitely when we compare the M35i against here the all-wheel drive iX2, this one here is the better ride. It feels like 
would be more suitable to the vehicle. Yes, the M35i drives also excellent, no doubt about that. But this one here just feels better. It is as sporty, at the same time a little bit more comfortable. Just feels as it would be the better overall package. But then again, hmm, the alternative would also be going for maybe the three-cylinder petrol engine or the diesel or whatever, you know, whatever suits your lifestyle best. Because here, aren't we limited with the range? So the recharging is somewhat limited at 130 kilowatt peak, means 10 to 80% state of charge, 29 minutes for fast charging. But what about the range here of the iX2 today? Well, as for the efficiency, it was quite good in good conditions. 16 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That's close to four miles per kilowatt hour. However, with more motorway mix in there, we rather got to 18, 19 kilowatt hours on 100 kilometers. That's more like three and a half miles per kilowatt hour. So overall, that means in good conditions and with not too much high speed, we are at around 400 kilometers or 250 miles of rearward range and with more high-speed motorway, more like 350 kilometers or like 220 miles. So which one would I buy? Well, in most cases, I think it wouldn't be enough range for me, but it always depends on the use case for the iX2. The X2 M35i, a little bit too rough, I feel. So honestly, my configuration for today would be Brooklyn Gray exterior, not the M Sport package, base, not the M Sport suspension, base suspension, getting a more smooth ride and taking the 28i in the US or the 20i in Germany would be enough power in most cases and not as rough as the M35i and then the Veganza seats on the interior as we've shown you with this very vehicle. This is a full review of the BMW X4 today as the top sports version, the BMW X4M competition. <laughs> to the front. Well, starting with the X-Line, with the normal BMW X4, we get LED as standard headlamps then, and optional adaptive LED lights. This is the highest option then. Beautiful daytime running light signature then in this case also. The X4M has this bigger front double kidney, also with a dark or black design and with the vertical fins right there, X4M batch. Also more impressive here and high gloss black in this lower area over a very strong stance in the road. But already as normal, X4 looks stronger than before in this new generation. This striking color here for the day, by the way, is called Toronto Red. 4 meter 76, 15 foot 6 or 187 inches is the length of the BMW X4. And usually it comes and starting with 18 inch wheels. But here the X4M competition would go up to 21 inch wheels. However, today we have 20 inch wheels with winter tires mounted. Therefore, the tires look a little bit bigger. Also, let's see also what that changes in the driving behavior. Then here the top model, the competition. Competition package usually includes a little bit more extra features always for exterior and interior actually. And here we have these side design elements, but they're just design elements by the way, so there's no function in this case. You know, with some BMW models, they have this airstream or air curtain function then in the front, but here it's not the case. Here we have contrasting black mirrors, and they have very aerodynamic, beautiful design. Then black all around the frames right here to make it a little bit sportier and this X4 new generation has a little bit more elegant roof line here and especially how it forms then to the rear strong shoulder and it will get even more interesting in the rear of course big difference X3 X4 is this falling roof line you know which has this sporty appeal but then of course also some practicability disadvantages really depends on what you like and of course the M model here comes with an M sports suspension the new generation of the BMW X4 comes here with these new horizontal tail lamps and I think they're really more modern and more beautiful. Overall, the rear is a little bit sleeker then, but then again, the X4M competition adds here this black rear wing together with a massive diffuser in the lower part, honeycomb structure right here, and then the sports exhaust. One, two, three, four. What do you think about the sound you heard so far? So what we have here today is the X4M competition, 3 liter 
inline six cylinder, 510 horsepower, 4.1 seconds is the acceleration figure, zero to 100 kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. Wow, that's of course pretty impressive. The non-competition model is at 480 horsepower, 0.1 seconds slower, if you can say so. And then this 3 d six cylinder is also available as the M40i with 360 horsepower. That's totally fine. And also a pretty cool engine pick. Probably I would rather go for this one for a better price performance ratio. And then of course you also have the 2 liter four cylinders also on the petrol side. And then diesels, you also have the choice between 2 liter four cylinder and 3 liter six cylinder. Interesting here of course that we have this additional carbon fiber bar, stability bar, that gives more stiffness to the chassis. Look at the interior, here carbon fiber inserts for this M competition model, very beautiful. And also other than that, instead of the doors, soft touch, everything from a great quality. Here you also get these M competition entry badges. Then steering wheel with the distinct M mode buttons, you can program them what they are supposed to do actually to give the car a little bit sportier touch and then that left side here to, for the cruise control right side to start the voice recognition system or for the volume for example then the x4m only comes with animal skin seats you can see these sports seats here they look amazing really cool as for the form and here also with the amp competition you get these illuminated badges inside well, for the base X4, you also get more sustainable or animal friendly materials. In Europe, for example, fabric and the fabric mixed seat. And especially in the US, you get the sensor tech in black and beige. So, especially for the sportiest versions, I would have wished some microfiber or fabric seat mix because then you don't slide on them too much also while driving sporty. Now, getting inside, of course, as always with a shoe tap, <laughs> get the interior clean. Well, here the seating position is upright, as you know from the SUV. But it's a little bit sportier if you have compared it to the X3 because the A pillar is flatter here. But if I put the seat in the lowest position with 1 meter 86 or 6 with 1, there's still enough headroom left, plenty of. Well, it will be less when you have a panoramic roof, this one here without one. I usually put the seat a little bit higher than again to have a more upright seating position right there. Steering wheel can be put up and down and in and out. And it's a very smooth process as well. So for these Additional sport seats, they are still somewhat comfortable. However, the base sport seats in the X4 will be more comfortable as they leave you a little bit more room to play with. These are, of course, a little bit more caging in, unless you really like that. Now to the interior, soft touch material here, dashboard, beautiful. Then you have the carbon fiber inserts here for the sporty models. It's also really cool. You still have a separate climate unit with this, you know, turning knobs, and I really like to have that be able to control it somewhat manually. Then in a lower part, either it being closed or you open it, X4M competition badge in this competition package. Inductive charging pad for your smartphone. In this case makes sense because we also have the Apple CarPlay wireless. Then adaptive cup holders and the special shifting lever. So interesting is that for the driving mode, you put it to the right side or for the sports mode once again, neutral and then rear so it's um, yeah, a little bit imitating as it would be manual. <laughs> so the top part here is for changing transmission modes and on the left side you also have different settings here. For example, all for the suspension when you want to put that manually, you know. So a lot of different variations. And on the right side still this turning pressing knob. It can also control this touch screen from below, for example, while driving. Cover here, very well attached. And if you open the armrest, some more space underneath with another USB-A charger. The second one is in the very front. Then with the steering wheel we have these M buttons right there. You can set them as separate customizable hotkeys. You have shifting pedals here which feel quite good. Hey and BMW wings here as the top lighting. I always like to see that. Do you fancy them as well? As for the rear there's also soft touch at the rear instant of the doors, so that's good quality wise. These sport seats here are quite voluminous therefore they don't also leave too much legroom. Here you see it's still okay for four tall adults, no problem, but not more. And if you compare, for example, X3 or X4 to the X1, the BMW X1 has the same legroom here in the rear because no six cylinders in that one, shorter front hood, but here in the X3 or X4, we do have the six cylinder possibility. That's why we also have the X4M here today. Well, headroom wise, 
I do exactly fit here. I can put a hand over my head still. So although you have this falling roof line, it still works with the X4. Well, the rear seating band is not the most comfortable one, so to say, also pretty short, but I think it's still okay. Here also interesting that you have the possibility here with this button actually to change it a little bit so you can put it a little bit more back or a little bit more to the front, change the angle of the back part. You can already also flip the seats from here. Other than that, here with the competition model, we also have these beautiful stripes <laughs> at the uh, seat, uh, seating, at the, sorry, at the seat belt. Yes, of course, seating belt. Well, and then there's the Isofix here at the outside and cup holders, adaptive also with these rubber and ski hatch. Last but not least, the middle unit here. You can also get a separate climate unit here and another 12 volt power supply. Well, you flip the logo here to open it, 525 to 1430 liters. So that's a little bit less in liter figure than with the BMW X3, but just a little bit because the liter figures are measured actually below this top cover here, which you can also remove, by the way, by the way, with two hands, of course. Then the trunk here as for the luggage size you see here fits very well, no problem. You can also reach over like this from here to flip the seats. That's possible because there are no separate releases right here. And also some measurements for you. So the normal trunk length up to the seats upright is here about one meter. The same also goes for the trunk width, a little bit more actually. And the height here up to the cover is about 50 centimeters. So overall good dimensions, just when you want to transport some very, very high things here in the rear. That would be a limiting factor if you compare it to the X3. And here in length, this is almost one meters and 80. Well, there's one thing here when you are in a basement garage, because then you see how high this one is opening and you have to pay attention that it doesn't hit the, you know, the top ceiling of the basement garage. So, I am not really sure, I have to put it against the BMW X3, but especially here then also with the top wing and so on, that can actually be a problem. Last but not least, what about child safety? Yeah, I think that's still quite okay. Welcome, my friends, to the BMW X4M, Thomas's active driving lounge. We'll pull it here with the first M button, everything in the sports gauges. I'll reduce the speed a little bit for you that you can get more of this acceleration. We start at about 50 kilometers an hour, so like at 25 miles, something, and let's accelerate out. That's 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles. Very impressive. Very even acceleration from this all-wheel drive. Wow. Smooth but yet very powerful. Nice engine sound. This 3-liter six-cylinder engine is superb. Not only in the M version here, but also in the normal base versions. What a great engine. And here, of course, delivering even more performance, being tuned from this software but it can also be quite efficient as well. More to that later. Wow. And car is still very stable here. Of course, not as stable as a sedan or something would be. So here I have to fight it a little bit. Here we go. And also with winter tires, you know? So when you're driving these high speeds with winter tires in an SUV, you maybe saw also that the car was, you know, moving just a little bit more as a sedan would do with some especially with summer timers so of course always pay attention to that in this sports mode also the suspension is a little bit stiffer than you can all individualize it as we shown you in the interior part you want to go down there guys there we go Peugeot 206 cc <laughs> funny little car right not being built anymore for ages but definitely really funny yeah, this hardtop construction was also a tricky thing. So you can always go back to the comfort mode again. Then a little bit easier to roll here just, but wait a minute, that's a tunnel. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. 
Yeah, or, or I really love electric vehicles. I have no problem when the car does not have any sound, but I mean, when we have a sound here now, why not listen to it? At least when we're here in the tunnel and we're not annoying anyone, you know, sleeping in their garden or something. So in the valley, uh, um, you know, in, in, sorry, in, in the village, next to the neighbors, I always, you know, try to pay as much respect as possible. You're on the motorway then, you can fly a little bit more. So now again back to 100 kilometers an hour and also noise insulation wise here at motorway speeds, really good. They've worked on that in this new generation, pretty amazing. Nothing to complain about. It's also actually suitable for longer motorway drives. No problem with that. And so the suspension setting here in the M, I mean, it's an adaptive suspension, so you can switch it around a little bit, but I'm a little bit more happy with that here than with the BMW X5M or the X6M. That was a little bit stiffer from the whole setup, but again, could also be a real thing. So I'm going to talk more about that. First of all, let's accelerate it out once more. Well, and here we go. at high speeds. Yeah, you feel the winter tires definitely they're swimming a little bit too much. And again, the winter tires are also not laid out to have like these high speeds. And you do realize it's an SUV. So yeah, I mean, it's, it's impressive how sport they could get it. But then again, at some point, you can't also deny the genes for that. Um, so a true sports car would be a little bit calmer than here in this high speed corner, definitely. But still a lot of sporty fun you're having here. <laughs> These solar bands always look like a speed camera, but there's no, no limited speed here, not yet. Soon there will come some speed limiting and we can use that for another break from 200 to 120, not hammering it completely, but here, you know. Wow, those brakes really hammer it in, but then you all, maybe you saw again, how it was, you know, correcting a little bit. So back to the normal driving mode again. Whew. Yeah. That was quite speedy already. So I can just conclude from this sporty driving part here, awesome acceleration and especially with winter tires you have to be, you know, paying attention. Winter tires plus SUV does swim just a little bit. So can't deny the fact that sedans are better as for the sports performance. But again, impressive what they've done here with an SUV, how sporty they can actually make that feel. Um, that's also how city driving is sometimes, you know, also oh, Jaguar F-Type. Soon also Jaguar F-Type facelift here in Autogefühl. Well, yeah, I mean, you can also drive actively in the city. A little bit, of course, you have to be calm, watch your cyclist, don't exceed the maximum speed inside the city, but accelerating out in a sporty manner from the traffic light, yeah, sometimes why not? That's why we are also still car enthusiasts, you know, like sentient car enthusiasts, but yeah, somewhere it's still in the blood. <laughs> well, and the thing is here, also inside the city, I can, for example, use the cruise control and it keeps up the speed then as I wanted. And I can also activate or deactivate the lane keeping assist, but that wouldn't be, you know, a big factor when driving here in the city. The thing is here, I was starting in sports mode, but usually I would go to back to the normal mode because here in the city I want to drive a little bit calmer. Unless the next traffic light is on red, for example, I can go back to the sports mode again, just using this um, shifting lever. Yeah, I mean, we can also then change the different transmission modes. Um, so in this case, when I'm switching to the sports mode, it goes also a mode up in the, trans <laughs> in the transmission mode. Well, when you go back, it really kicks you in there. But you know, the normal transmission mode is usually also just fine and already quite sporty. And there's really so much things you can do then. Here again, then we know with this M button, which you can individualize, or then the second M button, which you could set to an even harsher tone, but most of the time it's not really 
that relevant in the city. Um, especially also I would leave the suspension on comfort. Yes, you know, the suspension is adaptive, um, but still it is of course stiffer and rougher than with the normal X4 cars. However, I do feel, and maybe it's um, the combination also 21 inch and summer tires versus 20 inch and winter tires, which we have here. So you can also get the you know, summer tires 21 inch, that's the stiffest combination then. But here then, riding 20 inch with the winter tires, that is better to sustain. And I also had it with the BMW X5 and X6M, where we had the biggest wheels mounted that were available for that one. And then also with summer tires then in the US, that was such a harsh ride. So I feel that this ride here is a little bit better. I think it shows again that you should not always go for the biggest wheels. Yeah, I mean, they look kick-ass, definitely, yeah. But again, if riding comfort is any concern to you, you would rather leave it with the little bit smaller wheels. So the cool thing is, with this 3-liter six-cylinder we have here, you can also drive it in a calm way. We also know this engine from non-M models, and it's a very good overall engine. It can also somewhat be driven in an economic way, if you want so. So when you have cruise control, motorway and so on, you can score some 10 liters on one kilometers or 23 mpg US, 28 mpg UK with this vehicle here. That is possible as long as you don't <laughs> really use that throttle. And that's, I mean, the good thing about this 3 liter six cylinder, it's actually for a petrol engine a quite efficient one. Will be even better, of course, in the fuel economy figures when you're not in this M version because you're not tempted to use it all the time, all the way. And you know, maybe also you experience that here together with me in the city, it can indeed also be driven in a calm way. Here, also, I feel that the steering setup is, is really great and it's so much better than in the BMW 3 Series. That's again, yeah, maybe you've heard me complaining about that quite a lot of times with the 3 Series, I don't understand. Here, the SUVs, which are built in Spartanburg in the US, they don't have any dead zone area here, you know, in the low degree angles, but the 3 Series has. Why? I don't know. Here in the SUVs, especially in the compact SUVs, perfect steering setup, feels natural, direct enough, not too much work on the steering wheel, so it's a very great steering setup they did find here. The X4, of course, has a little bit less overview than the X3, so, and this one here, the A-pillar is flatter, um, so you feel already sportier. It usually also has a sportier setup when you directly compare base versions, so it really depends on what's your preference there, whether it's X3 or X4, definitely. But it has a, such a good and neutral balance handling, it doesn't feel too heavy doesn't feel too big. That's of course also an advantage if you compare, you know, X4 versus X6. So even if you say like, oh, you know, don't care about the money and so on, if you want a little bit sportier, better handling, then you would go for the smaller vehicle. And of course, you don't have so much problems like parking in and out. If you live in an area where space or parking space is no problem anyway, well, you know, then it can also be an X5, especially considering the price we have to pay here for this very vehicle. And you remember, you know, you can easily get a nicely specced X4 or like 50K or something. That's possible, you know, it's, it's okay. You know, euros or dollars. This one here, as it stands here right now, overall, 108,000 euros. Seriously, for an X4? Come on, really? Yeah, we had a lot of fun in the acceleration and the hours. The, the brakes are working very well, definitely always have to react to, <laughs> to the, these traffic lights. But then again, no, I don't think the price is really justified for that, you know. Uh, because already with the normal version here of the 3 liter 6 cylinder engine, the non-M version, you can have a lot of fun, it's no problem, yeah. But that's quite often the times with these high spec versions. It's time to take a detailed look and drive the updated BMW X5. Is it actually better than its competitors? And what has changed with this facelift? Let's find out together with Thomas Nautical in 4K, full screen and full length. Let's go here with the updated BMW double kidney, a massive stance. Yeah, it has become bigger and bigger, but I think that way 
it still fits to the vehicle. It's not like this mono kidney we know from the iX or something. The X line would be based now. They lifted the center equipment. X line has bright accentuations in the lower part. This is here the optional M Sport Pack. So we have black accentuations in the sport here styling. And if you would go for the M Sport Package Pro, then also the whole double kidney with frame and the fins here would be all blacked out. But I think that way it looks a little bit more elegant. Updated also with the headlamps, new signature in this arrow styling. And if you activate the turning indicators, then it has this pulsing effect, looks very interesting. Also on the light side, new. Before it was only with the X6, now also the X5 gets the optional iconic glow, the illuminated double kidney. Even while driving, it shines from the top part down then like a light waterfall. The length at 4 meters 94 or 194 inches, that has remained the same. New wheel stylings from 19 to 22 inch. These here are already 21 inch wheels, already in this M style, pretty massive. And the M Sport package here visible at the side and with these black accentuations. Dravid Gray is the color for today, actually. As for suspension technology, the adaptive suspension is standard and for most cases, this will be totally fine. If you have the M Sport Pack, then this suspension is set a little bit stiffer and you can get it even stiffer, some like that, yeah, in the Adaptive M Suspension Professional. That is then also combined with more technology like a rear axle differential, you have rear axle steering, anti-tilt control and so on, everything in one pack. However, this rear axle steering you can also get separately, like this vehicle has here. And then the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction than the front wheels, three, between 3 and 4 degrees, massively reducing the turning circle. And with this facelift here, they did an update that the rear axle steering reacts earlier at very, very slow speeds. Not at standstill, like we know from Mercedes. They don't do it here because, say, it applies too much force to moving parts and it wouldn't be good for long-term durability. But as long as you move really, really slowly when parking in and out, then it reacts earlier now to make it even easier for you for the whole parking process and so on. And then there's the optional air suspension. You would go for that one if you want the widest span between comfort and sportiness. That is standard, by the way for the plug-in hybrid model. In the rear, the facelift adds new lamp design for the rear LED and it forms this X when you take left and right side together. Overall, very clean rear design. Hmm, you have the six-cylinder plug-in hybrid here today and then <whistles> fake exhaust police, auto gefühl fake exhaust police because the outer tip is fake, real exhaust on the inside. It always depends on the engine and so on. It goes through, but yeah, what's your take on that? And two more differences between the M Sport and the X line. In the M Sport pack, we have the wheel arches in vehicle color, and also the lower bumper is in vehicle color. Whereas in the X line, once again, we would have a gray or silver contrast at the rear, as well as these more classic off road plastic wheel arches. And the updated turning indicators or hazard lights also get this pulsing effect now little bit more spectacular. By the way, sorry for the massive wind here today. You can maybe see it with my hair or with the trees and so on. I hope it's still okay from the sound quality for you. This vehicle is equipped with the M Sport Pack, so you also get the M Colors at the key fob. Then, vehicle door closing sound. Mmm, that's great. Really solid door closing sound, I like that. Then, instant of the doors, also very well built from the whole interior build quality. This is indeed very convincing. It's also a well-developed vehicle, meanwhile. M Sportback also gets the M steering wheel. That one is not yet available with any leather alternative. And you already see these two screens there. New digital cockpit layout, soon more to that. These are the comfort seats. You either have sport seats or comfort seats. The comfort seats are a little bit wider and indeed offer more comfort. And this special stitching here is always when it comes with the sensor fin that is now standard. This is like a very highly elaborated leatherette, so no animal material on the seat. And it is really soft and comfortable. So I can just recommend that you just have something to gain from that. So well done. Different colors are available, also bright styling, for example. Then 189 or 6 foot 2, there's a lot of headroom left. You also either have a manual steering control, or in this case here, we also have the electric one. So for tall adults, no problem at all. 
it's one of the most comfortable SUVs out there, especially here with the comfort seats. Many new vehicles go for cost savings nowadays. This one doesn't. Look at that. Here in this small cubby hole, with this opening falls down this compartment. Super softly dampen it. Also, when you close it, a very nice resonating closing sound. Interior cockpit overview with this face of here, pro and con. It looks cleaner, it is cleaner. 12.3 inch, 14.9 inch, curved display, one unit that looks cool, but you miss the manual climate knobs here for plus and minus. You still have the vent control here, yes, but to control the temperature, you have to plus minus that here. Hmm, okay, two plus or two minus something. That's interesting English for me, yeah. Um, whatever, you understood what I meant. For the vent strength, then you have to go into the climate menu. So that is the downside to me. However, this BMW OS8, or to be exact, OS 8.5 it is now, has, for example, an advantage. Apple Maps in Apple CarPlay can also be displayed here on the left side. It would also work with Google Maps here when you have an Android phone and then Google Maps here. When I use Google Maps here, I can also show that to you. Google Maps then here on the right side with CarPlay. That's interesting. Now I have Google Maps on the right, but Apple Maps on the left. Wow. <laughs> that's an interesting finding for today. Okay. Yeah. Um, that's live on Autogrifu indeed. This OS 8.5 has a new home screen. What they, for example, did is they made it easier for you to switch to the CarPlay and so on. Like here you have different possibilities, different hotkeys. Most actually directs you then to CarPlay or Maps uh, and so on. So I think that's also what most people are using. And the climate unit here up close, this also newly designed. There you can go for the vent strength and change some of the other settings. And seat heating, instead heated steering wheel is hidden here. What I appreciate, still real buttons at the steering wheel. Also the volume knob is still manual. Of course, you can also get a head-up display. And look at that, three quarters of the battery is full and 76 kilometers, so a little bit less than 100 kilometers or 60 miles when the battery is completely full is somewhat realistic. And even more impressive, the overall range then close to a thousand kilometers or 600 miles when everything is full, fuel and battery. A nice way to reduce high gloss black is here the carbon fiber decal element. You start this open, cup holders, adaptive, also cooled and heated, that's fancy. And then the inductive charging pad, yeah, that gets too hot actually because there's no cooling function for that. They did not do that with that facelift. And here in this middle console, you still have this control knob for the infotainment system that you do not have to use touch. However, this new shifting lever that looks cleaner and is just flatter in the integration has the downside that it doesn't have this typical BMW sporty shifting lever. And if you have the air suspension, you can also manually set the level then here when you, for example, go off-road driving or something or want to lower the car for loading in and out. And you now have the ambient lighting integration right here. That looks pretty fancy. I like that. You can also, of course, change the colors. Um, yeah, whatever you prefer. Dim it for night driving or not. I usually have it all the way right also while driving at night. What, what do you think about this? Rear compartment, also solid build quality at the rear doors here with soft touch and so on. And then, well, this is one of the drawbacks here. When you think about this X1 review recently again, it has the same leg room like an X1. And you wonder about the package. Yeah, it's because you also can fit so big engines there in the front. However, it is sufficient for five tall adults. So even here on the middle seat, it works. It's a little bit stiffer than overall, but even height-wise, it's no problem at all. So it does indeed five, house five tall adults. The X5, by the way, also offers the third seating row for a seven-seater option. If it makes so much sense in an X5, maybe as emergency seats. However, it's not available for the plug-in hybrid here as for space reasons. Then you can also fold down this armrest and then you for example have some cup holders here they're also somewhat adaptive as for the trunk special to the x5 is always this split hatch that you have the additional lower hatch the manual cover on the top well this lower hatch is cool for picnic sessions here you can even you know sit down together here with two people so it's no problem as for the weight 
the only disadvantage would be uh, for the button here when you stand in front of it and you can actually hit the button easily with your leg here. So uh, when you're standing like this, is, you know, see, I just hit it then with my leg. That can happen unintentionally. And when you then have your picnic equipment all the way distributed here, that might end <laughs> not so good. Well, but then it's nice dimensions over a meter of 40 inches in width, a little bit less than a meter of 40 inches in length and the height is about 80 centimeters or 30 inches. Folding the seats is not that easy from here. They have removed this electric function so you have to go around. Yeah, but that is then quite easily done. Then you have the full length indeed, but overall very well usable trunk. Also really nice quality wise here, this compartment with a gas strut. So that's pretty cool as well build quality. Here, for example, when you have dogs, this additional net. The difference is that here the plug-in hybrid has over 500 liters. The non-plug-in hybrid, pure combustion, has 600 liters, but it's just the compartment underneath. Above here, plug-in hybrid and the normal combustion engines are more or less the same. So no compromise, just that you have to put the charging cable in somewhere if you want to carry it. As for engines, 3-liter inline 6-cylinder petrol and diesel and the 4.4-liter V8 in the M60i. This one here is the six-cylinder petrol engine. That is also the base for the plug-in hybrid. You can see it here at the orange cable. So everything is electrified. It's always signaled as orange for safety reasons, actually. Also when you work on the engine and so on. And this one here, really quick in the acceleration figure, is less than five seconds. So 4.8 in the German horsepower figure. That's just half a second slower than the V8 because here you have the combined power of the combustion engine and the electric motor that is integrated in the transmission, by the way, so it won't change the all-wheel drive distribution. When you have an all-wheel drive model, which most X5s are, and it still has a rear-wheel bias, and even so in the plug-in hybrid. This one here, the biggest update as for the facelift, because in general, all the engines are at least mild hybrid now, and when you go for the plug-in hybrid, this one with a bigger battery now, now at 26 kilowatt hours net, that also increases the pure electric range, of course. So up to one kilometer or 60 miles, a little bit less depending on the situation then. And recharging, yes, you can always press the M logo for that when you have the M Sport Pack. 7.4 kilowatt AC, no DC charging. However, in four and a half hours with that kind of power, it's already full. Then. This plug-in hybrid is also somewhat of a performance version. Let's put to the sport mode and also sports or S shifting mode getting the boost from both drivetrains, combustion engine and electric drive. Let's go. That's already 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour. Wow, impressive. I mean, if you think about it, this is just half a second slower than the V8 and half a second quicker than the pure three liter inline six cylinder. And you still have that base engine under the hood, so you can enjoy this inlet six cylinder, which is the world famous BMW engine. To me, also one of the best engines out there. When you drive it slowly, not like this, this was an acceleration test. You can also score some nine liters and one kilometers, 28 mbg US, 31 mbg UK, or 26 mbg US, something like that in that region, um, which is quite, not super low, but Definitely okay for this kind of a vehicle. And then, of course, you can always drive pure electric here with the plug-in hybrid with the 50E. This new electric motor has more power. So it's a completely new electric motor. As we've shown to you here, 4.8 seconds is the acceleration figure. And here in that sport mode, you're making use of that also with the red background there. So both powertrains. And you can also go back to the hybrid mode. And also from the S to the D shifting mode down, more silence and so on. So usually we're driving in a normal hybrid mode and then for example here when I hit the brake, combustion engine is shut off, everything electric, everything silent and because of the good noise insulation here, you can also get the optional insulation package for, for that, it's also equipped with that vehicle. It is so super silent here in this vehicle so when you're standing at traffic light, it's super windy out there, you heard it earlier and you hear nothing from that being on the inside and this electric driving also fits to this vehicle so when I'm you know like 
or into some rural traffic and just start all electric. You have some kind of electric sound, but it's really drawn back. Of course, you also hear it from the outside at really slow speeds. And you can actually, oh, this, um, you can also drive higher speeds, pure electric. That is possible just when you pin down, then, of course, always the combustion engine is being activated. You can also see it in here in the instruments in which area you have to stay that we'd still drive all electric. And if I would exceed that one, then the combustion engine would be turned on. It is equipped with the adaptive recuperation. And that means when there's no one in front of me and I leave my foot off the throttle, the car is just rolling, no recuperation at all. If there is a car in front of me, then, and you know, and like this, not this distance, distance is actually fine. But if there's a car in front of me and the distance is too close, or here now the car will decelerate, the speed limit changes, then you can see I lift my throttle, lift my foot off the throttle, and then here there's adaptive recuperation. So then you don't have to adjust the recuperation level, the car is doing that for you automatically. There's always pro and con arguing that. The con is, it's not that predictable. The pro is you don't have to care about recuperation levels and it's in a way a relaxing feature because when you don't have to use regenerative braking, you're just rolling. And when it makes sense, then it almost acts like an adaptive cruise control when there's a car in front of you, even without you having set it. So I think overall, it's a very intelligent feature to have. And you can see here, even some quick acceleration, pure electric is possible and you even feel the gear shifts. That is unusual for electric car driving feeling, but the reason is that it sits in the transmission. That's the reason why you also feel the gear shifts, actually. And as the hybrid mode is laid out, most of the time you will first use all the electric drive, and when that's one that is depleted, then you will also use the combustion engine, unless you have these power moments. And why are they doing that? That the combustion engine gets activated at some point when you pin it down is basically a safety thing. So for example, I'm getting onto the German Autobahn and I see, oh, I need some more acceleration to get on that quicker and in a more safe way. Then it's actually making sense that I get the combustion engine power when I just pin it down in a, this panic moment. And then it's actually safer if I enter the motorway quicker or maybe do like an overtaking maneuver. And that's the reason why most manufacturers have this philosophy. That actually, it's always available. But it's really fun to drive it also electric. It does fit to the vehicle. Suspension, you will be fine with the normal adaptive suspension. If you have a base X5 without being the plug-in hybrid, the adaptive suspension by BMW is great. And it's more than enough. I would also not pick it in the sporty trim. Here the air suspension is standard for the plug-in hybrid because of the added weight by the battery. And that's why they said to keep the level of the suspension of the vehicle, it's better when there's also the air suspension support. And at the same time, of course, with the air suspension, it gets a little bit stiffer than also in the sport mode, a little bit softer in the comfort mode. So you have more variety when you have an air suspension, but it's not, I would say, it is a needed feature in the BMW X5 because the adaptive suspension is so good already. Does it feel like a floaty air suspension? I would say no, it's rather set on a sporty note. So when I'm driving it now and someone would tell me, hey, it's a good adaptive suspension and it's no air suspension, I couldn't deny that, you know. So it doesn't feel so floaty air suspension like, but it feels really good considering we have 21 inch wheels on that one. It's a very comfortable ride indeed. Most of the time you will leave it in the normal hybrid driving mode. Seats here also, long-term comfort is excellent. Here once again the combination, the sensor fin, high grid the red, with the comfort seat. The comfort seat will give you more comfort, especially in the US for example, it has a higher take rate than the base sport seat. In Germany the sport seat take rate is a little bit higher. Yeah, you know, some Germans like it stiffer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so and now a German motorway here. Once again, just over 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, now we can drive a little bit quicker. Super silent, very well insulated, so you almost feel like you would be rather in a low seating sedan as for the noise or NVH comfort. That's also one thing I really like about the X5. You could go miles and miles and miles without getting lower back fatigue or something. 
and it's still fun and it's also still sporty when you do some lane change here to the right for example it's really nice i feel the steering feel is also good and strangely the steering feel in the bigger bmw suvs is better than in a lot of their sporty vehicles and i still wonder why is that i have no idea so in the x5 has one of the best steering fields in, in the bmw model portfolio should be the other way around i mean it should all also be good you know or all should be good but yeah strangely that this is the case then here by the way are we still driving electric no we can see that here in that you know in the power meter let's drop it a little bit see when it does switch back to electric again there we are so here so we would drive 125 100, yeah, 125 kilometers an hour and if i go a little bit quicker let's see here yeah now the combustion engine is on so around 130 kilometers an hour that's like 70 80 miles an hour that is then the threshold for the pure electric driving and of course we can drive even quicker and here now unlimited speed on the german autobahn let's see Wow, it's still so silent in here. Can't believe that. 170 kilometers an hour and super stable also on the road and it doesn't feel like a high, floaty, big SUV. It feels like a sport sedan comparing, of course, only if you go to some very narrow corners with high speed, then of course you can't deny the fact. The Porsche Cayenne will still be sportier in a way, especially moving through the corners. So in sportiness, this one doesn't attack the can, maybe the high-end M versions then, of course. As for the Audi, it has also a nice sporty, balanced driving feeling for sure. The BMW X5 feels a little more sophisticated as for the luxurious features. The Mercedes GLE, that is meanwhile, hmm, the, the thing is, it's still a nice very, very vehicle, definitely, but also here the X5 feels like it would be so much more premium than the Mercedes GLE. I really have to say that, especially while driving, the X5 gives you a very sophisticated feeling. And I wouldn't even necessarily go for an X7. They are sharing the same platform. The X7 makes sense for you if you need more space in the back there and making use of the third seating row, for example. There is also the third seating row available for the X5, but I don't think it's that necessary. And yeah, I'm just keeping on my moderation so easily while I'm driving 160 kilometers an hour, so like 100 miles per hour, and it's just so effortless. Here with the upgrade, the facelift upgrade, mild hybrid technology for the normal combustion engines does give you some advantages as for the consumption, but not the super game changer. Here for the plug-in hybrid, of course, one thing we saw initially, just more power from that electric motor. And the other thing is then the upgraded battery, more size, and then yeah, we can really score some good range figures, pure electric, and also together with the combustion engine. So to me, one big advantage of the plug-in hybrid is also this combined range that you just have, what is this here? Okay. There's a nice saying in Germany, especially like the area where I'm from, where, you know, like has some coal mining background and People used to be, let's say, some, um, you know, straight, very straightforward people, you know, living there. Um, and then in situations like these, you would say like, Alter, this is kein Parkplatz here. Or like, hey, dude, this is not a, not a parking lot. <laughs> so, in, you know, referring to that, you don't drive so fast on the parking lot, of course. This is still a German Autobahn. Um, you know, you don't have to race. At least you should then pull over to the right when you don't want to drive that fast. Of course, the most important thing is always to keep distance to the car in front of you. Then you can also drive fast. Assistance systems, flawless. I mean, look at that. You have the lane keeping assist, the active one. Really no hectic movement, but keeps the lane and also really centralized. And just slight movements from the steering wheel. Cruise control, of course, keeps the distance in the car in front of you. Yes, that's also done by the Adaptive Recuperation Assistant here in that case with the X550e, the plug-in hybrid. And then there's also the active lane changing and you induce that by hitting the turning indicators just like tipping it like this. And then you can see here, car does it itself and gets in the lane 
and then the lane change is done. You might also ask yourself, why would you let the car do this? Um, yeah, it's here, by the way. There's someone in behind me. Then I have to do it myself because the car says, hey, that's not enough distance for me. And I also had this vibration in the steering wheel and the car was not changing the lane because there was someone approaching from the rear. So actually, very well thought out, very elaborated assistance systems. Also, you feel that this car has been built for a couple of years with this facelift, they try to, you know, perfectionize it even more and more. Exterior wise, I like the changes, but I'm also totally fine with the pre-facelift. Interior, it's definitely pro and con. The infotainment system looks cleaner and it is significantly quicker. So it is the better software. On the other hand, you lose the manual climate knobs and it's a little bit more complex. So that's definitely pro and con. My favorite are the seats here, especially the ones we had here today, the comfort seats with the sensor fin, this combination, among the most comfortable seats overall in the industry. Driving-wise, as flawless as ever, as we can expect from the X5, the plug-in hybrid especially now even more upgraded with this higher electric range. So indeed, if you compare it to the competitors, Mercedes GLE, Audi Q8 and so on, I think the X5 is at that moment one of the best picks you have, especially also recent consumer reports rankings that BMW is very good in the reliability score just behind Toyota and Lexus. And, you know, people have been saying, yeah, you know, they're money pits and so on. They're not reliable. They drive great, but they're not reliable. But it seems that BMW stepped up the game also as for the reliability, whereas other German manufacturers went down there a little bit in the reliability rankings. So that's also a very important factor to consider, of course. A full driving review of the updated BMW X6 with Thomas Nautical in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go here with the changed front double kidney. And actually, this is here with the vertical fins, the double kidney that the X6M had before. Now also here for the M performance model, the M60i with the 8-cylinder in our test here today. The M Sport Pack with accentuations in the lower part is always standard for every X6 model now. Of course, and also the same here for the M Performance model. Changed headlamps with a new daytime running light in this aero design. It's pretty interesting and you only see if, when it's on, when you come around here a little bit, when you look at it from the front, then you see that they're actually on at this moment. Also interesting that when you hit the turning indicators or the hazard lights, it has this pulsing effect. That's a pretty cool thing. Also this color, I think it's a very interesting green. It's called Isle of Man Green, so special M racing color. The length at 4 meters 96 or 195 inches and this side silhouette with the falling roof line and the really strong hip area. Some are on team love, some are on team hate about that. Which one are you on? Tell me in the comments. Wheels from 20 inch. This is here 21 inch and optional even 22 inch wheels. But I think you shouldn't go too large because you lose riding comfort then. Talking about the riding comfort, as for the suspension, it's very interesting. You can get the normal adaptive suspension, which is already a little bit stiffer in the X6 because the M Sport Pack is standard. Then you can go for the professional M suspension and that one then is even stiffer. Then you also get the rear axle differential lock, rear axle steering and an anti-tilt control. Or you can also go directly to an air suspension. That's also possible depending on how sporty the ride needs to be for you. The air suspension gives you the widest span between sportiness and comfort. Here, by the way, we have special mirror caps and carbon fiber. This is an option. They also have this special, you know, like aer aerodynamic M4. The rear axis steering, by the way, moves three to four degrees in the opposite direction than, than the front wheels, reducing the turning circle massively. Rear design here, very horizontally drawn tail lamps with a nice signature. Then there's a really fat M60 I bet you in this very version. I like that the vehicle color is picked up in the lower part of the vehicle. However, here, Auto fuel fake exhaust police alert because the outer tips are fake. Here, this you know middle split, then the rear exhaust on the inside. Yeah, they would be beauty enough, aren't they? Yeah? And in a time where turning indicators get smaller and smaller, this is definitely wide enough. Hmm. Honestly, sound-wise for the V8 here in Europe, we have the OPF. That's the particle filter then for the petrol engines. 
So the sound on the US models will be different. So I think in Europe, sound-wise, it doesn't even make sense to go for the V8. In the US, it will sound still, you know, much more growling. Engines with the BMW X6, the 3-liter inline six-cylinder diesel or petrol, or then this one here, M60i M performance model, 4.4 liter V8, 530 horsepower and 4.3 seconds is the acceleration figure. Above that, there's only the true X6 M model, but it houses the same base engine. Yes, a little bit more horsepower, a little bit quicker in the acceleration, but also like 50k difference in the pricing. So if you go, want to go V8, this is the more clever choice and you will already have more than enough performance. We'll show you all of that in the driving part. Plug-in hybrid, by the way, not available for the X6, only for the X5. Key fob always features the M colors because the M Sportback is standard for the X6. Then door closing sound. Ah, that's really cool, very solid and look also here, the panel gap, build quality, everything really even inside of the doors. You have everything very slick and clean, also here with the contour stitches and so on. The Hofmeister kink design also for the inside door handle, inspired by old BMW vehicles from the exterior part. Then of course the M steering wheel, here also with contour stitching, really colorful, but I like we still have real buttons on the steering wheel. But the new cockpit, that is something really different. Command driving position like you have in a large SUV. However, these here are the M Sport seats and they are stiffer as for the bolstering and also feel a little bit sportier overall. So I recommend either to stick with the normal sport seats or for the best comfort, pick the comfort seats. They're a little bit wider and softer. And the normal sport and comfort seat also offer the sensor fin high grade leather red with the softest bolt ring. Here, the M Sport seat, only available in animal skin. Interior cockpit overview with huge changes. Here, you now have this curved screen, one unit, two screens separately, of course, and 12.3 inch, 14.9 inch. And the climate unit inside the screen always stays at this very level. Then the climate knobs here are gone. To me, that's a downside. You still can control the vents here manual and has a nice clicking sound. And new ambient lighting here, I put it also in green. You can change the colors. In this case, because it's the M performance model, you also have the M badge. Otherwise, it would say X6 then in base models. Digital instruments come to life when you start up the vehicle like this. And then, oh, there's the eight cylinder. And they all have mild hybrid technology now, by the way, these engines. So that's a face up to there for you. also see this battery symbol that you can also gain back some energy via regenerative braking. And here the content, you can um, have different contents in here. For example, also the map from the Apple CarPlay, for example, that's also possible. Three important things to consider for this middle console unit. A, don't pick the high gloss black because it collects fingerprints and scratches and so on, but there are different decals available. Second thing, we slide this open, adaptive cup holders, oh, cooled and heated, that's nice. But then here, the inductive charging pad for the phone, don't use it, your phone does overheat and they do not implement a cooling function, also not in the facelift. Here, just use the cable charger and then put your phone on the cable. Then, third thing, this is this option for the crystalline look here for the shifting lever and also here inside of the turning and pressing knob. This is blinding you, it looks maybe fancy, but just go for the standard option. But by the way, you can see here, this is now integrated, really slim and small. Before you had the real shifting lever, it is pro and con. It looks cleaner, but it feels less sporty. News also as for the software, BMW OS 8.5. It cannot be retrofitted for OS 8.0 models because there's also more hardware underneath for that. And you have this home screen with the CarPlay maps. And here on the left side, you can also easily access again the consumption data, for example. This is a good thing because so far it was really hidden deep in the menu and there's still like so many functions left. So they created this new home screen to make it easier. Heated steering wheel and heated seats are by the way accessed right here. Yeah, to me it's also a little bit too complicated. That's the only down step with this upgrade. Rear seats, yeah, it's kind of like a black hole than here in this very trim. Nice Alcantara black headliner though, that, uh, that is actually quite fancy. Legroom, this is the catch of this vehicle. You hardly have any legroom considering the length. 
However, here from the height, also when you're tall, you can sit here in the rear. That's no problem at all. What I find cool is that I still have a manual climate unit here then for the rear seats. As for the trunk, this is of course somewhat a compromise here with an SUV coupe because that area here is lower. Then you have this folding mechanism for this cover, 580 liters, about a meter or 40 inches in length, but 110 or 45 inches in width. And the height here, it's actually fine. You can also reach over then here to hold the seats from here. That's possible. And again, just this height in the very front part, this is a limitation with like 45 centimeters or 18 inches. All right, let's go. <laughs> Plop, that's 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour. Yeah. That about this V8 M60i. <laughs> you can scream, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, she tried to hold back a little bit. Yeah, that was pretty powerful, of course. All wheel drive with rear axle bias. Yeah, it's 530 horsepower playing all the effect right there. Whew! Yeah, that is giving you the goosebumps or the adrenaline. And here now, adaptive suspension. Sportier note here with the M suspension professional, even stiffer actually. Then anti tilt control, that means the car is always keeping it upright. Rear exit steering, we also have in this one, rather plays an effect on lower speeds to reduce the turning circle and so on. Wow, this doesn't feel like driving an SUV actually. And whereas the X5, especially in standard trims, doesn't come close like to the sportiness of a Porsche Cayenne. Here in the M60i trim, and also with the stiffer suspension, yeah, this is matching the Porsche Cayenne in the sportiness, or at least coming close. So you can definitely compare these. You know, in the corner, also really good. As for the steering feel, very precise how you steer in the vehicle. You know what the vehicle is doing. And I'm really happy with the steering feel in the X5 and in the X6 as well. Yeah, there you hear the V8 definitely even louder than in the US versions without that petrol engine particle filter. Whew, wow. I mean, in, in tight corners, you still feel the weight, yes. In the low seating sedan sports car or something will be sport here in the corners because of the center of gravity. But still, considering for an SUV, this is yeah, as good as it gets. And I'm not really sure if the true M version would deliver you so much more driving fun. It is just stiffer, you know, and of course way more expensive. So if you ask me, this is totally fine here. And I think the M60i is also the better everyday vehicle because although you have the stiffer setup here in the M suspension, it still feels really nice to drive. Um, also, no, I was checking if it's an animal or just a leaf on the, on the road. Also thinking the adaptive suspension is totally fine if you compare it to a possible air suspension in this vehicle, because here you have the compromise between sportiness and comfort. And even though we have 21 inch wheels, okay, the road is actually quite good here also. We're driving around you know, Bavarian towns here at this moment, and of course it was outside. We have to see how it gets when it's a little bit bumpier, but wow, what a driving experience. Very cool sporty driving here really enjoying that. Wow. Yeah, so difference X5, X6 is more about really what suspension you pick. So you can configure both in an equal way. You know, that the one is a little bit cut off in the back doesn't make such a difference. It's more than, do you have an M Sport pack for an X5? Do you go for the adaptive M suspension professional? Or do you pick an air suspension? So you can really vary that according to the suspension picks you are doing. And here in the city, for example, you can always go back to the comfort mode. Everything is relaxed then and so on. D shifting mode, you can go back to that as well. In the S shifting mode, by the way, just pull the shifting lever once. S shifting mode always gives you more RPM, shifts up later, shifts down earlier. So this is separated, you know. So you can pick comfort or sport mode that rather does like suspension and already does something to the transmission, but then even more stress on a different shifting level when you hit this shifting lever and pull it backwards. So let me just show that you do once again, comfort mode, sport mode, all a little bit more RPM and 
S mode, you hear it's already a gear lower from that. So you can really vary that and of course also go to an individual mode, for example. It's also important then from the sound from the outside because maybe sometimes you have situations where you think like, ah, it doesn't need to be that loud when close to the neighbors or something. Maybe other situations where you think like, hey, I don't care, make it as loud as possible. Heard that sound? That was here the sign for the stop sign. So an additional acoustic warning that you should come to a halt at the stop sign. Maybe good when you sometimes miss a stop sign or something. Um, yeah, and of course there's a really high fine for not like coming to a total standstill on the stop sign. If you are here in the comfort mode, by the way, don't hear so much from the engine. But of course, at the same time, you can always go for the pin through. And then you also have all the power you, have, you need. So this is always possible and maybe also some situations where you get on an Autobahn and you need the sudden push. Talking about German Autobahn, motorway with even higher speed. All right, sport mode, as shifting mode and German Autobahn from 120 kilometers an hour. So like 70 miles an hour. Let's go. Oh, that's 200 kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour. We can go even even faster. Yeah, and then the window is picking up. But in general, I mean, how calm and silent this, this car is remaining. Wow, really impressive. Of course, you're not hitting the brakes, but they are also working very well. Good feeling also for the brakes, indeed. In general, I mean, like here at the normal motorway speed and non-German uh, thinking, like 100 kilometers an hour, 60 miles an hour, hardly hear any wind noises at all so it's really silent and this is also the other side of this vehicle yes you can go attack and so on but when you go comfort mode and normal shifting mode then it's as silent and comfortable just like a normal x6 or x5 and for also in the suv segment comparing to the competition it's very silent calm and collected you feel it is a very good premium product indeed and X5 and X6 both are among my favorites in this large SUV segments because this compromise, you know, like you, you can you can go really relaxed, long way, long mileage, especially if you pick the comfort seats with the new sensor fin. These seats you definitely also feel while driving. They are less comfortable because they're just stiffer. Um, so either normal sports seat or the best choice than normal the comfort seats with the new sensor fin. That's the best combination for best comfort, actually. Also, I feel that the, these seats are a little bit lower, so the steering wheel is then a little bit off as for the height. So I drive these seats elevated a little bit. And I don't do that with the comfort seats, actually. Yeah, but then with the press of a button or press of a throttle, it becomes almost a sports car. And it doesn't feel like it will be shaking up at all being an SUV. You know, 140 kilometers an hour, it's like 90 miles an hour. Changing the lane, changing back it in. Feels so good, calm and collected. Yeah, I mean, this adaptive M suspension professional is definitely helping here too to make it even sportier. Yeah, I was, I was surprised that it doesn't feel too stiff, you know. Sometimes when I have the M Sports setups in the BMWs, it feels too stiff, but here in the X6, it's actually, actually totally fine. Now at only like 170, 180 kilometers now, then the wind noises are picking up, but it's actually also fine, you know, so I can't expect more, more from that. Look at that, how calm and collected the car remains at this high speed. You hardly feel the speed at all. Really nice. Even at these speeds, of course, you can activate the assistance systems. The assisted driving you with the active lane keeping assist also works at that speed. Maybe it's not necessarily meant to do it um, for that, but yeah, also keeping the distance to the car in front of us, for example. And then here, once again, also accelerating again. Here in the slight bend, the lane is being kept. And let me also show you the automated lane change. We go just tipping it and then the vehicle does it on its own just didn't work at super high speeds so they have a speed limit for that that was with 140 kilometers now still worked let's see 160 
Yeah, oh, still doing it at 160 kilometers now. Wow, that's impressive. So, of course, most fun is when you do it yourself, and also using the turning indicator yourself, for example, really like putting it in, that is so much fun. So not tipping it, but really like, bang, putting it back again, that's really cool. Has so much good haptic feeling for that. I like to do that here once again. Wow, what an Autobahn SUV we have here. And yeah, one thing you, by the way, feel the new mild hybrid system is, not on the Autobahn, but when you're driving really slowly, for example, and then there are some electric moments actually where the engine shuts off and you roll basically like when you're parking in and out there this mild hybrid system can play a role other than that minimum consumption when you're not doing things like this like 11 liters on one kilometers 20 mbg us 25 mbg uk so it's like 5 mbg less or two liters more definitely in comparison to the six cylinders so the eight cylinder will consume more fuel definitely and of course, when you do more high-speed driving like this here, yeah, then it gets definitely worse. Here we are at the moment at 14 liters on one kilometer, so that these are figures less than 20 mpg, of course. So um, yeah, always depends on how you drive. BMW has worked on their X7, and you have asked me, can they now catch up in the SUV segment to Bentley or even Rolls-Royce? Do they make them obsolete? We're going to find out here in Auto Fuel with Thomas with the update BMW X7 here in Brooklyn Gray. What a setup. Look at that with the extended shallow line. Here you can see then the double kidney is in all black. And look at that, how large it is. Vertical fins right there. And also in here in the M Sport, the contrasting lower bumper. What I've done is here with the front setup, they have split the daytime running light and the main headlamps. This has created a lot of discussions. Some love it, some hate it. Tell me in the comments which side are you on? Are you team love or team hate? But overall, I think a very impressive setup. They wanted to make a bigger differentiation between the X7 and the X5 or X6 to put this one here even more upmarket. Yeah, maybe also to attack the top luxury brand. We're going to find out if that works or not. You wonder about the big microphone today? Well, there's a generator and some, you know, like waterfall stuff running in the background. So best sound quality for you. Length here at 5 meters 16 or 203 inches. That hasn't changed, but what has changed? The wheel size is starting now from 20 inch as base up to 23 inch now. Biggest one so far at BMW, and here these are 22 inch, already very massive styling in these M style here. Also, see the bed right there. Wow, and then the M Sport also then has this contrasting side here. Overall, a very impressive look. And you can see this is also optimized for space, so especially for US customers, they're using this as a people carrier basically, or for the family and stuff. Therefore, more upright windows that you really have also space on the inside, technology wise. Optional here for the 40i or standard for the M60i is rear axle steering and anti-tilt control. Gives you more sporty feeling, but at the same time, rear axle steering also somewhat fakes a shorter wheelbase when these rear wheels go in the opposite direction than the front wheels, also reducing the turning circle. Very interesting, by the way, that with this new electrification, mild hyper technology, when I'm easing the car here around and just rolling downhill, then the engine tends to shut off and you're rolling. The car is still somewhat active, but the engine is already shut off. It's not a true hybrid feeling, but already some mild hybrid moments. Yes, an X7 looks bulkier in the rear than an X5, for example, because again, space also for the third seating row and so on and for the trunk. But here with this sculptural three-dimensional tail lamp design, really nice. It looks again a little bit more dynamic and this chrome strip here goes all the way across. I think this color here works very well for the vehicle, doesn't it? Look at that here in the lower part. <whistles> Auto Fuel Fake Exhaust Police because, well, the outer one is just for beauty cosmetics. It works well design-wise. Yes, the real exhaust on the inside. So in this case, although it's not just about, you know, the real thing, I think it kind of works, doesn't it? What's your take on that? Overall, I think Considering this is also form for this function, it still was worked on very well design was. Or what do you think? Do you like the design? Tell me in the comments. And more colors for you. This one here is 
sparkling copper gray. Very interesting. It has some kind of copper nuances when you look very closely. Also a very cool color indeed. And this one here is frozen Marina Bay blue, the matte paint. This one looks really striking. I mean, in combination here with the black wheels in 22 inch, maybe a little bit too much, but I would love it for the example here, the matte blue with bright wheels. Oh, what's your take on that? But yeah, this is also one of the most, yeah, I mean, screaming out colors. It's not bright, but still like this has a big presence on the road. And this green color is called Verde Hermes. It is special, very unusual to see such a vehicle in that color. Would it be something for you? Tell me in the comments. This is the car key. It's actually light, but good quality. And then you close the car here on top and open it like this with the key to entry and door closing sound. Ah, beautiful. Yeah, that's really nice. And then inside of the doors, also very good material used. This is also Sensatec leather red here, soft and real buttons here, everything very easy to control, Hofmeister King design uh, citation. Also big bottles fit in this side pocket right there. And now big news for the cockpit, you see here one curved integration of that well, one carrier, but then screens 12.3 on the left, 14.9 on the right. Soon more details to that if that's a good idea or not. Here is the M Sport steering wheel. I appreciate that we still have real buttons at the steering wheel, so that's straightforward to control. And then about the seats, look at that. This is also big news then for the X7, also available for the X5, by the way. These here are the so-called sensor fin seats. They're an evolution of sensor tech, so they're animal free, but super soft. Look at that, how plush they are. The surface itself feels really great and they also have this pattern on it so that looks really amazing it's available here in black or also in a bright styling we had it earlier at a different vehicle in the uk is also the um, the standard to all of that actually um is it standard there well you can get it in the uk at least i checked the configurator in the us it's definitely standard and um, also great choice moving everything forward uses way more or less resource in the whole production process and it feels even better. So the X7 has never been that comfortable with this new seat here. This is really amazing. In Germany, it's not in the price list or the configurator, but you can just tell the dealer, I want these seats, and then they promise to get it. That's what they told me, at least. So seating comfort is awesome indeed. By the way, the BMW 7 Series, there it is called Veganza, but it's basically the same material. They just used two different brand names for that because they're different suppliers. Here, the X7, X5 and so on, these big SUVs are being built here in the US, in Spartanburg. Whereas the BMW 7 Series is built in Dingolfing, so that's in Germany, and then they have a different supplier, but they have the same material quality for the non-animal materials. Really interesting. Here, headroom with 189 or 6 for 2. Still plenty of headroom left, although we have the panoramic roof and we have this command driving position here. You feel like king of the road, but without, let's say, exaggerating it. You know, these top high-end luxury brands like, you know, Bentley or Rolls-Royce, sometimes you have the feeling that they're going a little bit over the top. Some appreciate that, but for me, for example, I like a more form of subtle luxury. So not saying like everyone like, oh, look at that, you know, but more being a little bit functional, and this is still somewhat the case here. Maybe not with the infotainment, but we're soon going to talk more about that. So, look at that there. The cockpit looks really clean and cool, I think. Nice wood integration right here, but of course, different styling decor elements are available. This look looks like modern textile here now. Here, this is the way you control the vents, and there you can have some ambient lighting. Soon, I'm going to show you that. Rear knob still for the volume here in the lower part. Yeah, but then the thing is really with the screens. So there is no separate climate unit available anymore. I did prefer this from the pre facelift. And here it stays always in that part. Yes, that is somewhat helpful at least, but to control it while driving, I mean, it's okay for such a solution, but it was easier before. That's one of the things I do criticize with this facelift here. And Let's take a deeper look here into the software. And this to me is a symbol of over-engineering of the software Clock 2. I, it, it took me a while to figure it out. How long did it take you? 
it is 25 past 8. Yeah, that's the time, actually. And then it switches, you know, like in in these... What the f fail? <laughs> yeah, about that. But, I mean, let's take a look at the rest of the software right here. It looks quite amazing, actually, from the visual part. However, I think it's just over blown so os8 is to me too functional in a way um, or it has too many functions i love the os7 uh, especially when i want to here i want to have like the consumption figure right here and then i have to go here vehicle apps and then to live vehicle and then content and then trip data and <laughs> okay i'm asleep so yeah that just takes too much time. I don't get it. Yeah. However, the car internal GPS is still one you can use. Oh, it's a Frank Sinatra drive. Oh, I heard President Obama was also in this hotel here recently. So then let's zoom out. Here we're in Palm Springs. So that's actually pretty cool. Very well usable. The CarPlay integration. And that is very well to use. Definitely interesting thing. Definitely. Um, let's see about the sound system this is the Harman Kardon sound system and this gives you a really nice true in-depth sound so yeah I love that wow that's cool so I really like to drive the vehicle and listen to music and at least the volume I can still turn down and also on the steering wheel I can also um, put the music up and down and yeah I love the I love clicking sounds in the vehicle right because they somehow present a user interface so you get along with the infotainment system it's fast enough but it's more complicated than before but what about the instruments then here the digital instruments let's put that engine alive here we go and then you have left side the speed and right side the rpm and you can also adjust the things here for example the content what you want to see here maybe also some gps content and so on or from the car internal map and then here this then the layout so you can also change that depending on what you prefer here i also prefer the pre phased layout but yeah you get along with this easily so it's not it's not an issue or something so what we can see here is the head-up display hey, Michelle, don't, don't steal my microphone so i'm sorry that's my part what you can see here is the head-up display. <laughs> Very nice to see. I also put it here to full brightness at the moment. And here a closer look at the ambient lighting. I'm also switching the colors through. Of course, you can even better see that at night. And I also don't dim it at night. That it looks really still kick-ass, yo. <laughs> so of course, Thomas Blue it would be for me, right? So um, not this one, but definitely Indigo. By the way, what I can't show you here at the moment because I would need a web connection here for the smartphone. I don't have that here at the moment. You can have the Apple Maps actually also in the instruments cluster with the Apple CarPlay. Google Maps, you can also have there, but only with the Android Auto. But at least you have then one solution each. That's also a helpful thing to have that definitely. And what I also find cool with this car, you have separate buttons for things like a separate button at the inside of the door for the rear shades and I can easily activate or deactivate the rear shades without going deeper into another menu just one button here at the inside of the door and that's it and you know I can control my seat my own seat of course from here but I can also switch here at the inside of the doors for this so-called gentleman function and then I can also control the <laughs> the other seat <laughs> on the other side so um you know when someone gets in the vehicle and says like ah i don't know um this is also a cool camera slider in here in this case right goodbye michelle <laughs> yeah so the most expensive camera slider so. yeah the most expensive camera slider yeah yeah these seats are very expensive so i think it's cool function that when someone doesn't know the kind of like oh i don't know how to adjust the seat like Wait a minute, baby. I can show you how to adjust the seat. Lower middle console here. You can slide this one open. And adaptive cup holders. They are also very well built. Here still USB A charger. This one is inductive charging here. It does not have this new function. The air sucked away yet. So um, the thing is with the inductive charging, it tends to overheat indeed. So I would probably rather use than the cable charging solution. And then this is also new with the facelift. You don't have the real shifting lever anymore. Pro is, it's a more integrated solution, it's cleaner and, you know, have more space in a way, visually, but I do prefer the real shifting stick over this one. This looks just digital to me. 
when I'm in a BMW, I want to have like thing to retouch and feel, you know. Um, this is still, of course, a real deal, but the big one to me was cooler. Here you select the driving modes and the start-stop engine. And it is also equipped always with adaptive air suspension. And you can also see it right here because you can also change the level of the air suspension but it also does that automatically for example when you drive really fast or in sports mode then it also goes a little bit lower and then we have the split opening here for the armrest there we go with usb c charging rear seating is super interesting indeed so you can still here uh, electronically control the seats but you can still touch these buttons Michelle can show that on your side so what I'm doing here on on my side now these buttons here and unlike in the all new 7 series where everything is digitalized and you have to slide the seats and control them like with screens in the rear this is so easy because a straightforward solution and here that way for example when I move the seat to this position I could still sit here and then we'll see how much space there will be in the third seating row but if I have the seat here all the way back on that side here you can see this is the maximum legroom we get. Of course, it's a long vehicle. It's not the best usage of space overall, but still plenty of space, of course, for tall adults. For me, one meter is 89 or six foot two, and headroom here also still works, even though this is the one with the panoramic roof, of course, from the rear seats. Gives you a great view, and it's, wow, it's so comfortable in, in the rear here. So this is, to me, also one of the most comfortable cars in the rear here overall. You can also adjust the back part here in the angle. Here in the front, we have mounts for iPad holders, and I think this is also somewhat a better solution than external rear seat entertainment. And so, Because when you just put some holders in here and use your own iPad, I think it might be the best solution overall, isn't it? Also, the sensor fin material here in the back, it is so soft and high class and, and quality. So even if just quality and feeling plays a role, I would always go for this one here. It's really the most superb I've seen in the automotive industry yet. Here, this part, you can also move down for cup holders then, and they also secure the bottles quite well. And some more space right here. And now it will be very interesting what we can score in the third seating row. But just a quick remark here in the front, use BC channels, two more, and then you also have a separate climate unit, this one here, when the engine is running, and still works with real buttons. But once again, the seating comfort here in the rear is really top notch here for the second seating row. And now this button here is to fold the rear part only, and the button below that is for the entry function and then the front seats moves a little bit forward therefore it takes a few seconds first and then this one goes forward and up and this is also a very easy solution then for an entry remember the alternative to this bench all the way through would be captain's seats in the second seating row these are also available then you have two individual seats here in the second seating row and you can maybe move through the middle it's quite tight though um, so this is maybe the better solution, but then the question is, do you want like 2 2, two setup or a 2 3 2 setup? And this one here with the through bench has the big advantage that you can fold all the things all the way flat. I'll soon show you that from the trunk. The captain seats are a little bit more exclusive. Yeah, but maybe this one is giving you more possibilities. And here the interesting thing is, when I move this seat here forward as I could still sit there, then I could also somewhat closely fit into the uh, third seating row here so it is somewhat proof indeed for seven tall adults also headroom is closely but directly working and you can see here isofix also for the rear seats so you could also install some child seats here good that they thought of that actually so indeed this is probably by this by this solution here the best luxury suv people mover also and even um you know easy of course when you're not that tall or maybe you have children who don't need like extensive child seat but are already not that tall it may be something in between this is like a good use then for the third seating row and you also have some luxury amenities here in the back um cup holders for example or also a separate climate unit, even seat heating for the third seating row. Uh, yeah, but I think you gotta check the options list for that. Let's check out the trunk or the boot. It's a split gate here, and this allows us a cool picnic function, for example. You can sit down in here and have a chat with 
whoever you desire. <laughs> it's 750 up to 2120 liters is the capacity. Of course, a little bit less if you use the last seating row. But step by step. This is like you know a small cover. You can also just remove that. The width here, you see here, is a little bit more than a meter or 40 inches, so that's really cool. And the total height here is a little bit more than 80 centimeters or 32 inches so very very usable here you can see easy storing of the things and then you can slide them out so for packing things it's actually quite nice to have this additional space here yeah this is <laughs> how you can see how you can remove that thing as well and then underneath look at that there we go so underneath we have here a storage of that bigger cover and some more space and this is at the moment here the setup here with the second seating row and there are different buttons here for example um, max luggage and with the max luggage button um, it only works when the car is properly powered let's see there we go yeah has enough power yet so then this one also falls flat there we go takes a while it looks definitely really amazing and you can see here this is then the third seating row it's all the way all the way flat that is actually pretty cool and then you can have individual settings here or then max people button and this one then moves everything up so a very convenient solution and there again we have the third seating row this one you just put it up manual then you still have some space here left behind the seats but overall, very well usable. Hardly we see a top-end luxury car that is so well usable indeed. The best engine that BMW has to offer is the 3-liter inline six-cylinder turbo petrol engine. Look at that, your 380 horsepower and 5.8 seconds in the acceleration figure. If you want to go a second quicker, you could also take the 8-cylinder, 4.4-liter 8-cylinder, that is then the M60. However, this one here will be more fuel-saving than the 8-cylinder, that's for sure, and it is definitely enough for this vehicle. In Europe, you can also still get the 3-liter diesel. Welcome to Thomas's Luxury Driving Lounge with the BMW X7 here today, the 40i, the six-cylinder. And to me, the right engine for this vehicle is the most efficient one. You can go like 10 liters or more kilometers, 23 mbg US, 28 mbg UK easily. That's possible. Sometimes even better. Cruise control straight, not too fast. Here a little bit worse at the moment because we're going uphill, uphill, uphill. Uh, but they have made this engine a little bit more efficient also worked a little bit some tweaks here and there also mild hybrid integration so going forward also in this case the eight cylinder will have more punch however so like a second quicker in the acceleration figure however it will also use like you know like five mpg worth or like two two and a half three liters um, more per one kilometer so um not sure if you want to really have that yes you have a little bit better sound low it's like low frequency growling but again you know to be more efficient saving some fuel then of course the six cylinder here is way to go and here we can also show you some acceleration i'll just do it from a standstill right here i'll put it to the sports mode there's one button for that also go to the s shifting sports mode and go from zero miles let's go Up 55 miles and that's a quick acceleration and that was a nice sound from the six cylinder yes the v8 would be more growling low, low frequency that is fun however here the six cylinder is lighter on the front axle that's of course also an advantage and you've seen the acceleration more than enough power and that's also the cool thing about the x7 it is a large suv but still it doesn't feel too different from driving in the x5 or x6 Yes, they feel a little bit sportier, but since you also have it's an option or standard with the M60 V8, that rear axle steering, especially at lower speeds, this SUV feels so agile and also has a narrow turning circle because of that. Really good job and also this anti-roll control. Although we sit upright on the road, we have a great panoramic view to the front when we are passing through some great landscape roads like here. 
it is amazing still it doesn't shake up at all in the sports mode the adaptive suspension also makes it a little bit stiffer have more contact to the road i have a good steering feeling so i always wonder about that is it from you guys in the us plan in spartanburg that you somehow have a better feeling for that because i've been criticizing bmw 3 series especially and some of the new beam all new bmw models for losing the steering feel because they have this new philosophy of making the steering wheel light so it's supposed to make the car more agile in the feeling yeah i can understand how they mean that but i don't think so for me a bmw has to have a natural steering feeling and believe it or not their suvs have the best steering feeling in the lineup it's supposed to be the 3 series but it's but it isn't you know bmw x5 and x7 have probably the best steering in the bmw lineup nowadays and yeah that's really astonishing but it's just the case and have a very good steering control feeling over that so although i'm driving let's say the most bulky bmw there is in their lineup i'm having so much fun here up the road of course you're overtaking this lincoln aviator here it's also one of the competitors yeah, and literally it does overtake this one because we have such a great interior build quality. We've seen that earlier. Also, the nice new sensor fin seats. I also activate the seat cooling here at the moment because it's already quite hot outside here, outside of Palm Springs, outside Palm Desert. What a beautiful area here. Always love to be back here. And of course, also Joshua Tree National Park. This yeah, one of my favorite places. Just been there again there yesterday. Oh, we're catching up to an X5. Wow, it's such a great race up the hill, almost like uh, going up Pikes Peak. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yes, in a 5 Series sedan, this road would be even more fun. But considering the size, it's still a lot of fun. And we can also go back just to the normal comfort mode. And you can easily go up that here. S shifting mode turns up the RPMs higher. That's why you also hear a little bit more of the RPM. Um, but here in the D mode, it's also just fine. You can relax them a little bit more. Yeah. But also when we are in the somewhat softer steering here, I don't have too much, you know, like sports mode, more resistance. In the comfort mode, not so much resistance in the steering, but still feels natural. And also suspension wise, it's fine. You can stay in the normal mode. But I think, especially here, that you reduce some G forces on the body of driver and co driver. I think it makes sense to go in sport mode when we're going up these winding corners here and to me that's the essence here also of a bmw product that no matter which segment it is in it does deliver a sporty driving feeling and they do achieve that also with the x7 here that's the cool thing to me indeed the six cylinder especially in the corners feels a little bit lighter so when you're more running straight i mean you like you're at the big intersection and then you start using the V8, hit the throttle, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, that's something appealing to our bodies, definitely, especially when you're in car enthusiast. But here for winding corners, I think the six liter with a, uh, less weight does appeal a little bit more. And yeah, as I said earlier, in running straight, cruise control, highway use, it's also giving you some uh, decent mileage considering uh, this, this size of an SUV, definitely. As for the roundabout visibility, it is, you know, this in this built upright style from the windows, this greenhouse we have around, and therefore the roundabout visibility is quite nice actually. And let's say, oh, like sunshades, yeah, it's efficient to block out some sun, but I want to have more visibility. One press of a button and these blinds go down. So I like the direct user interface. The only thing I indeed have to swallow is that separate climate control. I like to have that um, down there. There is one possibility for you, if you say you don't need the space of the X7, um, you're like fascinated by the vehicle, but the X5 is more or less the same besides the third seating row. Um, yes, the different siding on the exterior. Oh, sorry. Yeah, BMW surely doesn't want to hear, hear me saying that. It's more or less the same. Yes, they want to be the X7 more upmarket now, and they do easily achieve a Rolls Royce or Bentley. They surpass them with that, especially also in the driving part, you know. So it just feels so much better and this is already an expensive vehicle but you don't need to pay more money to get a better vehicle you do not get that then you know so this is to me 
probably the best luxury SUV on the market here at the moment. And when there are some others out there which are more expensive, it's not really worth it actually. And yeah, talking about the X5 there in front of us. So if you want a little bit more agile, you don't need the third seating row. You can easily go for an X5. And the sofa version still has the manual climate unit, but already gets here the new sensor sim fin seats I'm sitting on. So this could be a good compromise. And if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe right now because soon we will also give you an update on the BMW X5 facelift and see, I guess they will also put these screens in there and then we'll also lose the uh, temperature dials as for that. So we already reached the top here now. I'm going back to the comfort mode. I can also set in here the uh, cruise control, for example. There are different modes to activate, for example, the assisted driving um, or the distance control. So depending on if you just want to have the car um, to reduce the, the distance of the car in front of you or then this is the driving mode. Motorway, it's the main use case for that here on these winding roads. You see here, yeah, you don't want to trust in it 100%. That's just too fast. It's also not what the system is laid out to. It's more meant for the motorway. And on the motorway, it's working very, very well. We also have blind spot monitor in the side mirrors. So all the assistance systems are not too Intr um, intrusive so they let you drive the car still but if you activate them they work quite flawlessly just not when we have too many winding roads but that's the cool thing about this driving party today that we can show you these beautiful winding roads here and the agile character of this vehicle which is still present at the same time it's just a good cruiser when it's going straight you can enjoy hours and hours and hours going on a road trip go see some national parks and um, you always stay fit and activated put the seat uh, cooling a little bit higher to stay cool in these seats here still um, enjoying the plush comfort that all works very very well Zoom. will you join the dark side for the all-new BMW XM Zoom. <laughs> It's already clear right now that this vehicle here will split opinions. The BMW XM is a dedicated BMW M model, the first one since the legendary BMW M1. And here they decided to go with an SUV, a performance SUV, because they thought, well, there's the Lamborghini Urus, for example, or the Aston Martin DBX, and we want some share of that market, actually. This car is for people who want to attract attention and maybe don't want to be liked by everyone indeed. And you can see it here with this huge double kidney illuminated as well. And these golden accentuations here are standard actually. You can depict them and go for a black frame, but they are actually standard because BMW wants this car to look unique and special. Cape York Green is this unique color as well. And well, you see, I always have this hobby that I try to uh, wear my clothes fitting to the vehicle color. And I really had a struggle today. I hope it is like at least somehow fitting. 21 to 23 inch. And these one I need the biggest 23 inch. Once again, with the golden accentuations. Most screaming out model, but you can also go for... Can you hear say for more subtle ones? You know what I mean. The same accounts for the golden strip here. This is once again standard, but you can also have it blacked out for a more sinister and less golden look, so to speak. The overall length is 5 meters 11 or 201 inches. The wheelbase is the very same of the BMW X7, and they do also have a base platform share, but they have a lot of differences as well. And you can see that the body form is not the same. So it's also a little bit shorter than, than the X7, and here it's more like a so to speak, an X7 Coupé, but once again, the dedicated M model, here also with even more contrasting accentuations. You might ask yourself, why would they not go for a supercar for an own BMW M model? Well, the thing is that the time for supercars is rather over. Today's electric vehicles have great acceleration figures for maybe like an Think about the Kia EV6 has supercar figures, for example, and then this supercar segment is getting less attractive while the SUVs are still surging in sales. And so BMW decided to go for the BMW M model, the first dedicated one after the M1 with an SUV. 
It is in the way 2.8 tons. And the question is, can it still give you a lot of performance and driving fun? Well, they try to achieve that by technology. For example, rear axle steering as standard, so at lower speeds, the rear wheels turn in the opposite direction than the front wheels. At higher speeds, in the parallel direction. Has an adaptive suspension, no air suspension though. So you know that the BMW M philosophy is rather not going for air suspensions to give you more contact, more feeling to the road. And also an anti-roll stabilization. Everything yeah, is basically standard with this vehicle. You only pick the colors and some options on the interior, but that's it. And yeah, I guess the price will also be accordingly. Have you already decided for love or hate? Have you decided for the dark side? Well, it might continue right here. Look at that, the horizontal integration of these lamps. And then it's really a very bold statement also in the rear. And come closer here. These are laser engraved BMW logos. Also a past citation of the BMW M1 looking really retro racing alike, definitely. Well, talking about racing, the top speed here of this vehicle is 250 kilometers an hour. Optional with the driver's package, 270 kilometers an hour. That's then 168 miles per hour. I don't want to meet that at that speed <laughs> on, the, on the German Autobahn. I'd rather do it myself than later on in a driving test. Here in the lower part, look at that. Once again, the golden accentuations. And what? Look at these exhausts. These are definitely not fake. Real exhaust tips, of course, supposed to be for BMW M vehicle and interesting that they're not next to each other, but in this vertical layout, really massive from the design. Do you like that? I mean, just look at that, these sculptural lines here. So, I mean, what I like about this vehicle is that they want to be unique. The rest of the factors, I will tell you more about that later when I think about it. Let's first concentrate on the facts. Let me open the hood and let's take a look. Of course, you know that always he's pulling it two times here with BMW. And what we have here is a 4.4 liter V8. Here we go. With either 650 horsepower or with the later label red, 750 horsepower. This version here goes 4.3 seconds to one kilometers an hour or 62 miles an hour. The later available version will be even quicker and it's not only the v8 it is a plug-in hybrid so they went for this plug-in hybrid because i say our true bmw m model will be electrified so we can also expect that the future bmw m5 will get the very same powertrain here 26 kilowatt hour is the battery capacity supposed to give you a maximum range of 80 kilometers or 50 miles up to a speed, pure electric driving, 140 kilometers an hour or 90 miles an hour. Of course, in most cases, both powertrains will be used, especially when you hit the accelerator pedal. So that's the way they can get the most power out of this vehicle. How does it work with the all-wheel drive? It will still have a rear-wheel bias for this all-wheel drive because the electric motor is integrated in the whole transmission. So there's no separate electric motor on the rear axle or something. No, that's not the system they're using. They're integrating it. So basically everything is working together unless you go for the EV only mode. That might be a thing for emission zones in cities or something or that you're a little bit more quiet when you're starting up the vehicle in the morning. This is the vehicle key with the M colors. Yeah, that's it. Cape York green vehicle color here. Would you pick this color? Tell me in the comments. We'll be looking forward to that. Um, yeah, sorry. Now I close the vehicle. Yes, it's always because when you put your finger right here, then you close it. When you put your hand on the inside here, then you open it. And door closing sound. That sounds cool. And then inside of the doors, we see things we haven't seen before, especially this color combination. In this case, also fitting to the exterior color. And also the rest of the interior has specific M gauges here, for example, the M1 and M2 button. We know that from other existing M vehicles, there you can have your individualized driving modes. For example, you say like, hey, M1 is maybe like a mid-sporty driving mode for me and M2 will be like sporty all the way. I would have put everything from the assistance system and helping. Uh, ESC aids everything off, then you can do that here individually. Also contrast stitching. 
still real buttons on the steering wheel. The seats are in that sporty M style as well with a lot of shoulder support, for example here, and also have these nice illuminated logos right here. So that's also a very cool idea. Um, the car does give you also a very distinct interior smell. This would be a turn off for especially for Chinese customers who expect that the car doesn't smell at all from the interior. Well, and one of the reasons is that they still use real animal skin in this car and in this car and there might be like 5, 6, 7, maybe 8 cows in here and you might think of what is the reason behind that because it's 2022 and BMW says we want to be a very sustainable brand and we want to go for more electrification, also for more sustainability. But here there's no other alternative to that. And that's, of course, from a customer's perspective, not acceptable. The seating comfort, however, is actually pretty good. So you have this combination in here of, um, you know, like SUV high seating position. At the same time, you have a lot of support so that you, when you're driving a little bit fast, which you will do in this vehicle, being kept tight steering wheel can be adjusted electronically like this so how does it feel also when you compare like an x5 x7 or something you do feel that they are sharing the same base platform but you sit lower it definitely feels sportier you feel more integrated in the vehicle you don't have this super command driving position you would have in the x5 or in the x7 um, it's really yeah, it is from the exterior still an SUV, but from the inside, when you feel how you sit here, you already think, yeah, this is definitely going in the sports car direction. BMW OS 8, 12.3, 14.9 screen, so two screens, but they're integrated in this one dash. And you already see here, you have special M gauges here also inside the menu. And also throughout the rest of the interior here, very cool from the ambient lighting here, very reduced design, then carbon fiber here. That's actually quite cool because you don't have so much black piano like then. And then we also know this here where you can adjust the uh, the, the shifting, for example, that you have a more crisp and faster shifting. Um, so this is special to the M cars here that you also have a real shifting knob, of course, still. And here is then the setup for the M modes, for example, where you can switch between normal road driving or sporter driving and also the setup button where you can then individualize your driving modes. Oh, and then, of course, here this special exhaust button where you can spice it up even more. Digital instruments, they have this split view, also special M gauges. Left side, you'll see the speed. On the right side, you will see the RPM. And then in the infotainment, you can see when you are in this M setup, then you can fine tune your chassis, steering, and so on. And this you can also set to the uh, M1 or M2 button, for example. So here, there we go m1 or m2 configuration and then you can really say like yeah this is my mode i want to have this in spot plus maybe steering a little bit lighter or stiffer and so on so highly customizable this is what they want to do here with their M vehicles and this lower part here will then be the ac unit so no real dials for that we already know it from the os8 at least it stays always in this position then so you can get along with that more or less and what they also do is get customer feedback and feedback from our channel and we said hey why don't you reintegrate the ac on or off function that you can have this you know like the humid making it less humid in the interior um, so you can turn it on or off so that's actually also possible other than that the home menu looks like this also with a special gauge here the visualization also with the fitting color for example and then you have this gauged view here with all the apps and your auto apple carplay wireless connection and wireless only indeed Sound system, by the way, either 16 speakers Harman and Cardon or here Bowers Wilkins 20 speakers. So not only here, but you have another one here down there, for example, and both will actually do fine. And look at that integration here of the inside roof here, microfiber in this 3D landscape sculptural style, and I can also change the color. It is on the cost of not having a panoramic roof. 
So you cannot open it, you cannot see through. It looks like you could also remove it as a shade, but no, it's not. It's fixed, but then you have this special effect. It is something special and it is something new and unique. That's what I love about it. However, on the cost of not being able to go for a panoramic roof, hmm, not too sure about that. What is your take on this? If mom and dad are going racing, what about the kids here in the rear? Well, even for really tall kids, no problem. <laughs> you know, I'm 189 or 6 foot 2 and this still leaves some headroom, although we have like a little coupe-alike style here, no problem indeed. And a lot of legroom here as it's the X7 um, wheelbase, although the seats are very thick here, of course. And it is very comfortable here in the rear, actually. Um, maybe even more comfortable in the front. I could very well imagine being chauffeured in here. So the seating ergonomics here is actually luxury sedan-like. So yeah, that's indeed very comfortable. That's on the plus note. And here, this part here, adaptive cup holders, you can fold it down. And you can also use this one here as a ski hatch, for example. Other than that, you're of course not as flexible as with the BMW X7 here in the rear. That's not the intention. And with 530 liters of luggage capacity, you lose 220 liters in comparison to an X7. You can also get a bag here with a charging cable, for example, for the plug-in hybrid. You can see here you lose especially a lot of height, indeed, for this big plug-in hybrid battery. This is here just a cover you could remove. I already folded one half of the seat. It's at one-third, two-thirds bits. So you still have a well-usable trunk. But there is, of course, losses here because they need to store the battery somewhere. I can at least stand underneath here somewhat. Well, a super interesting vehicle for sure. I would like to know from you, are you on the love or the hate side? Have you joined the dark side already with this vehicle? There are ups and downs with that one, definitely. So what I really like is that they are somewhat daring and say like, hey, we want to create something unique. You know, in a car world where a lot of models always look the same and through all the segments they start looking the very same, I think it's cool that there is some differentiation and also some fresh ideas. Hey, not everyone is loving golden wheels, but I mean, offering golden wheels for a special vehicle that is, as it stands here right now, about 180,000 euros or dollars. Why not? However, the concept then with going so high in the weight with a plug-in hybrid drivetrain, 2.8 tons, you move a lot of weight on the road and you're not deciding yet saying like, hey, we got an all electric SUV that is, you know, our sports thing. You know, I'm not so sure about that. The plug-in hybrid is still a compromise. And of course, also that on the interior, you still only get animal skin, whereas in other segments, even for the BMW 7 Series or the i7, the electric version, they offer great alternatives now. They have that, but did not put that in this vehicle. So overall, I think, hmm, I'm a fan of the uniqueness, but I'm not a fan of the whole concept and that they weren't consistent with what they do instead. This seems to be like it is set off from the rest of the corporation, which is in a way also intended. But is it the right decision? I want to know that from you. Join us in the comments. What you see here in the front, that there is the new Tesla factory, Berlin Giga, Berlin Brandenburg, Grünheide. So, and we are here with the BMW Performance SUV. <laughs> <laughs> this is nuts. And actually what we can also show you on this parking lot is actually here. Look at that. Is this here the best electric performance SUV? The BMW iX M60 here on Auto Group with Thomas. Let's go. And by the way, we'll also have Brian later on with his take on this vehicle. Here, oxide gray is this interesting color and the M60 doesn't look too different from the normal iX version, but it has these Titan bronze accentuations in that front double kidney or mono kidney. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I always have to shave also here in the middle that I don't have to get the mono brow, so maybe the iX should do that as well, right? <laughs> Near the headlamps, LED of course standard, 
optional, you can get the laser lights and then the very slim daytime running light right here. The length at 4 meters 95 or 195 inches, so a full size SUV. Usually it would start with 20 inch wheels. The M60 version starts 21 inch wheels and here the optional biggest one 22 inch wheels, really massive and once again the Titan bronze accentuations in the M60 also the special batch, black contrast in the lower part so it automatically gets the M Sport package you can also get for the normal iX and then once again Titan bronze also here. You can however if you don't like that also go for the shadow line and then everything that would be in Titan bronze here would be just plain black for a more sinister look. Interesting that the air suspension is standard for all the iX models and this one, the M60, also gets the rear axle steering as standard as well. And the air suspension is a little bit stiffer here for a sportier tone. And a new feature is that the rear electric motor, so it's one in the front, one in the rear, and the rear electric motor is a little bit different even hardware-wise tuned to that performance of 1000 100 newton meters of torque and 619 horsepower. And whereas the normal iX all-wheel drive model goes 4.6 seconds in the acceleration, 100 kilometers or 60 miles an hour, this one here goes 3.8. Point 0.2 of that is done via the new launch control, which also has a hardware shaking function to make it even more exciting. We will experience that for you. Here the rear. The lamps really, really slim and once again the Titan bronze accentuations and also a very clean design in the lower part with some, you know, diffuser styling. And we also have more color choices for you. This one here is Aventurine Red. Of course, the Titan bronze accentuations are a little bit more present than in this case. What about the range? We already had a lot of experience with the iX, with the normal all-wheel drive model. This one might have a little bit less of that range because of more performance. However, roundabout. 400 kilometers or 250 miles in winter time and you can score some 550 kilometers or 350 miles in summertime. And one of my favorite colors for the iX is here the Storm Bay Metallic, really beautiful color and the Titan Bronze accentuations in the M60 look even cooler in this case than as a contrast I think. What about the top speed? The X-Drive 50 is limited to 200 kilometers an hour or 125 miles an hour here, the M60 unlocked to 250 km an hour or 155 miles an hour. And about recharging, 11 kW AC or 195 kW DC charging peak right here. Also nice covers here. That is well done. That's how you do it. And well, about the state of charge, 10 to 80 percent. Well, that can be done in 35 minutes in an optimum case. But you have to speed it up on the motorway that the battery is warm enough. It's a preheated. There's also a preheating function. It is when you put a charging station in the GPS, but that then can take about up to 30 minutes that the battery is at temperature while driving. So most use cases will be you have it on the motorway, then the battery is warm enough and then you can go for some proper fast charging. In the other test, we also did a concise charging test, so you can check out the other video of that one later as well. And one of the favorite features, look at that. The camera cleaning function, really spectacular, isn't it? But static here now, yeah, look at that. What a mess. But look at that in the rear. It's actually <laughs> even more spectacular. And yeah, once again, you should only do that when the car is already dirty <laughs> overall. Thomas asked me to step out from behind the camera just to tell you a couple of things I really like and maybe a couple of things I don't like quite so much about this car. So we have to start at the front and talk about this. Well, according to BMW, they need this much real estate to cram in all of the sensors and what I don't think the camera can quite pick up, these heating elements here and here, which make sure that the car functions properly in colder temperatures. Well, you know what guys, no other manufacturer seems to need quite this much room. And to my way of looking at it, it kind of looks a little bit like an afterthought, something that they put onto the front of the car while they were waiting to figure out what they were going to do, but didn't quite get round to, but that's just my personal taste and it wouldn't stop me from appreciating the rest of the design. As you come round to the side and the rear of the car, everything really works for me an awful lot better. To open the vehicle, either use the key fob, which has these special colors here for the M60, or use the smartphone with the app. That's both possible, but I'm clearly team key fob. What about you? And I'm definitely also team Titan Bronze. This is special and looks cool. 
because the shadow line then with the black accentuations you can get for so many different vehicles. So are you team shadow line or team Titan Bronze? Tell me in the comments. Door closing sound, frameless doors, hmm. Yeah, and that's also the reason it sounds really weird when closing it. However, we have cool interior materials. This is all animal free sensor tech right here and it's really soft and feels great. So everyone that is telling us Ah, you can't make uh, animal free, great, high class interior. It's not true. You can do it. BMW shows it right here. Interesting, by the way, that these crystalline applications right here, these are optional and you can also get them rather plain. And I would also take the base, the plain option for that because these here, they look cool, but they do have some blinding effect in sunlight. Seating choice today, we have the beige sensor tech. It looks great and it feels great and also has the perforation for a better climate comfort, so especially in summertime. I would actually go for these here indeed. They're also available in black or in brown, that's possible. And then you also have a fabric microfiber wool share mix available and two animal skin options, sadly still. But these here are definitely way to go. Seating position, high, upright, command driving position here in the SUV and with one meters 89 or six foot two. Yes, if you haven't heard, I have grown a little bit, obviously, <laughs> here. Still some headroom left, although this is also the one with the panoramic roof. However, well, it's a fixed one in this case, so it does not cost you headroom. This is the thing then with the fixed uh, glass roofs. They don't cost you headroom, but then you also can't open them. Steering wheel up and down, electronic way, and also in and out. And these seats are really very comfortable indeed. Interior overview, really clean, soft touch leatherette, sensor tech a dashboard, it's really cool. And you have this floating display, a little bit curved, 14.9 inch on the right, 12.3 inch on the left. This is standard. The steering wheel has this strange form. It looks cool, but is it better to handle? Definitely no, I would just prefer a normal uh, form of that one. But here, once again, the cool, like these golden accentuations and still a mix of, you know, some real buttons at least. The middle console is also worth taking a look at and soon more to the screens. In the digital instruments, you now have special iconic sounds, sound design here. Ooh, it's more bass intensive. I think it sounds way better than normal iconic sound startup. Yeah, awesome, stronger. And then you have here the left side speed, right side is also this, uh, you know, this is e-power meter, but you can also change the views a little bit. For example, here you have the layout and change the whole layout with that. Um, yeah, I mean, you basically once set your favorite thing and that's kind of it. And you can also have this map integration. And look at that, if you have CarPlay and the Maps app, then it can also be displayed here in the digital instruments. That's a helpful feature. However, it does only work with the Apple Maps app, not with Google Maps, at least on the Apple. And here we can see it in Android Auto. It does work with Google Maps here on the instruments. So that's the difference. Hmm, interesting. Why is that so? Infotainment, BMW OS 8 and everything looks cool, but I think still it's harder to use than OS 7. It has more functions, but also it's more complicated than here. The climate unit is integrated right here. They want you to, to, want you to use like uh, the voice control and then change it. That's possible. Set the temperature to 23 degrees. I will set the temperature yeah, to There we go. So that works, but I just prefer to use manual knobs for that. At least it always stays in this position. On the left side you have these hot keys. That's so okay. Therefore you can also for example hop to the GPS map. But then here there's like an overflow, you know, so many different things you can actually do here. Android Auto, Apple CarPlay is standard actually if they can supply that at this moment. You maybe heard that with newer software versions they're waiting on an upgrade for that. But here and with this vehicle no problem integration really big. Here we have these 13 speakers 4D and Wilkins sound system and it's indeed a great sound, really lovely. However, I think the Harman Kardon system more fits to BMW from the sound experience and it's also less expensive. At the same time also delivers a great sound. So overall, yes, it does the job. You see it's also very responsive. It's fast enough. Here let's take a look at the car internal GPS. 
Um, here it takes some time to load. This is a new airport here close to Berlin. Um, so overall, I'm okay with the software, but I still prefer the old school BMW OS7. Is it just me? Tell me in the comments. And here we can see these augmented reality arrows when we have a root set. Then the camera image is there from the rear or front view, in this case front view camera. And we have these arrows here guiding us alongside. And this is a very helpful feature indeed. Then it switches back to the normal GPS. Look at the lower right part there. This says adaptive driving mode. So when there's no car in front of me, by the way, the flashing light is from the IR light here. I'm just rolling when there's no car in front of me, when I lift my foot off the throttle. However, now I'm getting closer towards the vehicle and when I now lift my foot off the throttle, the car does do recuperation. That's the adaptive recuperation driving mode. That's really cool. I recommend the setting. However, we can also do the B mode. That's the B mode then. And in the B mode, when I lift my foot off the throttle, then it does immediate recuperation. That is then a one pedal driving. So you can do one pedal driving if you like, but I would recommend the adaptive recuperation. It's the best of both worlds. And we have the head up display is a nice option. And here you can see when you have the GPS set, then it also shows these complex map images when you're about to cross an intersection. Here this middle console floating. We have a nice wooden element. This combination is only possible then with the crystal line stuff here. And once again, it looks cool, but it does have some glaring effects. So I would rather keep the base version. This is the shifting lever, backwards then for the drive mode or B, the strong recuperation mode. But they also have adaptive recuperation then, which is a good choice. More when driving, you can put smartphone right here, for example, that's possible. But actually for charging, you put it underneath. And here underneath you have the inductive charging pad and when you lift it up you can see these are small holes that suck away the air so that the smartphone does not overheat. And in front of the cup holders you can see there's like this open area in the front. That's nice. Both Brian and me really like that. It creates a nice open atmosphere in the vehicle. Nice soft armrest, split opening and actual decent speed. speed decent <laughs> space underneath. Well, it does have space and speed indeed. And I really do appreciate that we still have a manual button for the glove box. Um, this is our allowance here to park at the airport. But here, this is really cool because, I mean, it looks standard, but some new EVs, they just have it in the, um, you know, in the display. I really want to open it in an easy way. What about you? In the rear area, it's also fairly comfortable and also a lot of legroom left. They're really using that EV platform. Headroom, yeah, I mean, there's plenty of headroom. And here you can also look through that panoramic roof, which has this electrochromatic function if you go for that one. It's, of course, always a spectacular effect to close it off or open it, so to speak, in this way. Yeah, you can move around freely here. Also, in the middle part, you can easily house five tall L's here. Here's a little bit stiffer on that one, but you know, some like it a little bit stiffer. Yeah, and then uh, let's <laughs> move down this one here. And here we have cup holes which fold out like this in the front and everything once again also in the rear from this sensor tech material really great quality in the middle part we have a console here and there we still have manual climate unit hmm maybe i want to be a rear passenger here today 500 liters up to 1750 liters great folding mechanism the normal length is a meter of 40 inches and the same goes for the width very well usable and when I take out the backpack here in the very front, you have storage for your charging cable. And here, look at that. Uh, clicking sound here when you close it. These are beautiful details indeed. And the absolute length here for the trunk to the seats as we would be driving, this is enormous. So, uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> and then one meters 90 and 74 inches. And here I can easily st stand underneath it. So it's, uh, yeah. Pretty large opening, it's cool. And you can see here the hazard lights when you have that hatch opened. <laughs> There's like the replacement hazard lights. Really interesting. But let's take a look at the real one, the problem is, oh. Child safety test, great. This was really good. So uh, yeah, our children are safe there in this case and, and cats, of course. And here when we close the hatch, let's take a look. Here, these then are the normal hazard lights or the normal turning indicators. And that's how the turning indicators look like in the front. So far, so good. Thomas and I are broadly speaking in agreement, but here is where we diverge. I really like this steering wheel. I think for a new bolt design, you need a new bolt wheel. 
And I appreciate the fact that BMW haven't just gone with the same old, same old. It looks great, it's modern, but you know what? It's actually really fun and effective to use too. So that's a big hit for me, as is, again, controversially for Thomas, this driver display screen. It's clean, it's uncluttered, it's stylish, it's modern, and there's not too much of it. Thank you so much for not giving me nine screens I don't need and only giving me exactly what I do. On which subject, let's get on to something that nobody needs but is super awesome anyway, and that's this roof. Look at that. Nobody needs that, but who cares? It's so much fun. It'll keep your children entertained for days, and it really suits this car. So I got a feature on a negative to end with. Crystal knobs, come on guys. That's been done, it's been tried. It kind of looks a little bit tacky, but more important than that, as Thomas did mention in his previous review, they do genuinely blind you when the sun hits you. And that for me is a bit of a miss. Welcome to Thomas's active driving lounge with the BMW iX M60. And what you see here in the front, that there is the new Tesla factory Berlin Giga, Berlin Brandenburg, Grünheide. So, and we are here with the BMW Performance SUV. Isn't that a great occasion? And here we can also test the famous new launch control we put here in the sports mode. Changes the sound setting, hitting the brakes with the left foot, and now the acceleration pedal with the right foot here on that empty parking lot. Launching towards Tesla now. Who wins it, BMW or Tesla? Let's see. Woo! <laughs> so that was zero to 70. Interesting. I mean, this parking lot is, um, uh, is not too long. However, then I you know, don't have to do it on public roads. And yeah, and of course, I just want to be close to Tesla for that one. It's interesting, right? So zero to 70 and of course, then also hard on the brakes. One more time, guys. Listen to the sound. And did you see it on camera? This car is literally shaking. It has like a hardware shake. Oh, there's like a lot of dust uh, rolling there. It's really shaking in the launch control. That's the new thing, you know, like here. Here, like, we're re you feel it, Brian? We're like really shaking. The camera, you can see the camera shaking. It's going further. Then it's stopping. Hey, what about, what about that, Hans? So Hans Zimmer designed that, you know. Why did you stop it? Yeah, um, probably the owner wants to keep up the shaking for, uh, you know, some period of time. <laughs> this is nuts. And actually what we can also show you on this parking lot is actually here. Look at that. This is like the rear axle steering and also in that sports mode we have more loose uh, electronic stability control. You heard that tire screaming. So I can really put that car around. Wow, and I have the EC all the way on. It's still getting somewhat loose. Wow, this is really amazing. Whew. So yeah, that is a difference to the normal X-Drive 50. Yeah, it does give you some extra boost. There's 1,100 newton meters of torque and wow, yeah, the air suspension is indeed tuned to a stiffer level. And uh, yeah, that's all the Tesla workers going home, home now. <laughs> they might wonder like, what is this guy doing there with the new BMW Performance SUV? And might we build something better? Or is this one actually better? Yeah. Um, whoa, yeah, so that's the difference here in the M60 version. I mean, from the outside, you uh, might not expect that it is so different, but whoa. Yeah, I mean, the sound experience has also been enhanced. It has this more sonorous, low frequency sound. And here actually, I mean, I did think about the location here a little bit because now we're getting onto the German Autobahn, the German motorway. And this will be a part actually where we can also drive unlimited speed. And you know, this one does have a speed unlock. I'm not sure how fast we can actually go. It also depends on the traffic, always, you know, a little bit. But um, yeah, let's just see how it goes. Whew. Yeah, that was already something. Um, good that we found this empty parking lot there. And yeah, once again, <laughs> greetings to all the Teslas, Tesla workers, putting up a show for them. So we're still in the sport mode. You see here this screen also stays. That's a thing when you're using the GPS, it does never switch back. That's a little bit weird, isn't it? And now we are starting at about 70 kilometers an hour. And at the moment we can't launch it yet. 
to first see that we safely get on the motorway. Uh, Brian, can you check the, 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 the action cam um, like here with the display? Um, are we seeing the speed on the small? Are viewers seeing the speed actually, like in the lower left part? Are we seeing the speed? Or is it better, better this way, right? Like when we have the central speed better here, like this? Right? I think so. Yeah, that's better. My aged eyes are not oh, uh, focusing okay, okay. on such a thing. Anyways, let's now accelerate from 110 kilometers an hour. Let's do it through. kilometers an hour, 125 miles an hour, and we go further, and now we keep distance to come in front of you. Safety first here, wow. But I mean, even if we are here at speed, there's still acceleration going. That's amazing. Wow. And also that stiffer air suspension. I mean, it's an SUV. It's a huge car, but it stays upright very much. The steering is to me a little bit maybe too artificial when I'm here on the lane change. I don't have the best feeling for it. Yet at the same time, what is really cool that it stays rather upright. So that stiffen up of the air suspension is doing a good job and it has really great handling. For a car of that size and that weight in this segment here, it drives really awesome. That is amazing. And you may also notice that, maybe covered here a little bit by that sporty sound design, when we were driving at high speeds, wind noise wise was perfectly silent. This is one of the best insulated vehicles I have driven. It's really very silent here on the motorway at high speeds. That's really very, very well done. Good traveling comfort also in these Sensatec seats, soft and upright seating position. So you can drive it in a performance way, but at the same time, you can also use it as a cruise vehicle or performance vehicle once again. Launching it through. Wow. Now we're at 220, closing top speed. And wow, this is now 250 kilometers an hour, 155 miles an hour, top speed. Now it gets, gets getting loud, but wow, that is really getting up to speed. And we perfectly use this part of unlimited speed now, hard on the brakes, but wow, we have so much energy running with that, but the brakes, we're doing a great job. So you feel that, um, you know, from an engineering standpoint here, this is an awesome piece of metal or aluminum and carbon fiber. <laughs> In this case then, uh, yeah, this is really something, you know, we have tested a lot of different vehicles now from also new electric vehicle manufacturers and they do better software, yes. But here with this vehicle explicitly, 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 you the native Navy speaker, was it? Okay, thank you. You feel that all the experience from the engineering does pay off. So yes, the user interface could be a little bit more refined and I can use an, you know, like a Alcantara like steering wheel or something, but wow, this is awesome piece of hardware. And looking from the exterior and the interior, we thought like, ah, there's not a big difference to the normal X Drive 50, but now driving it, yes, it's not a completely different vehicle, but you definitely feel more difference here now, extra 50 to the M60, than you would expect by the minor exterior and interior differences. And that to me is a very interesting finding. At all times, you can use my modes driving selection. Here, go back to personal. This is then the more normal driving mode. You can also have individual settings and then everything is rather calm. Cruise control is set here on the left side of the steering wheel. You can also pick different uh, modes, whatever you want to, for example, the assisted driving mode. Then we have also active lane keeping assist, for example. Let's see how intrusive that is. Smooth reaction here, keeping us central in the lane. All the assistance systems are working really flawlessly. We also have blind spot monitors right and left. There will be like this flashing triangle. So assistance systems wise, everything also top notch indeed. Yeah, one of the initial question was, is it, is it the best performance EV SUV? Performance EV SUV or performance electric performance SUV. And at this point, I mean, we haven't driven the EQS SUV yet, but I have to say, at this point, I really have to say, kinda is, you know? Uh, you know what my point was already uh, with the last review? In general, iX with iX3, 
as for price performance, I would still prefer the iX3 because it has easier user interface, has less price, and it's just, you know, still great to handle. This one, of course, with a dedicated EV platform, more efficient and so on. But still, I would rather pick an iX3 for better price performance. But if money does not play a role and you want great performance and you're okay with the infotainment and the digital units here, yeah, then this is here one of the best high price luxury choices. Uh, yeah, I can, we can, I can really say no doubt. What about you, Brian? Two thumbs up from Brian. Brian seems to be impressed. The BMW X1 is our price performance winner for today because obviously lowest in the price, also the smallest one. Yet you have already very good seating comfort, especially in this new generation. This is one of the very good things. So you have a good seating comfort, although it is the smallest one. And especially in comparison to this generation X3, you also don't have any lack of space or something. So the usage of space is also very good with the BMW X1. The BMW X2 is to me, especially in their performance versions, a little bit too stiff, unless you especially like that very, very sporty ride. Now the X2 in this new generation is also a little bit longer. So actually the trunk overhang then is a little bit longer but also the price will be a little bit higher than with the X1. The BMW X3 is a choice when you want, for example, a six-cylinder engine, which you cannot get with the BMW X1. However, if you note that although the length is longer, the space on the interior is not necessarily that much more. BMW X4, the coupe version of the X3, we had it here in the performance version, also the pre-facelift, so you can check out the differences between the X3 facelift and X4 pre-facelift if that is any relevant to you. The BMW X5 is my personal favorite here in this comparison because it has so much comfort, especially with these new sensor fin seats, high-grade leatherette. You have a full-size SUV, you have a lot of space, and it just gives you this very, very high sophistication. With the facelift, the only thing I don't like is that you lose the physical buttons because the climate unit has gone into the screen. Yet again, this software update also accounts for a more reliable Apple CarPlay connection. The X6, you don't lose too much space with that one. It's more a matter of design on the exterior. Just a very, very good of the height in the trunk. That is the only thing you actually lose. Other than that, it's really just a matter of preference if you go for the X5 or the X6. So they are both, in a way, my personal favorites than here in this review. The BMW X7 is, of course, in A and B pillar, basically the same. Just then behind that you have more space, more flexibility. A seven-seater there also makes sense. So high-grade luxury, top full-size SUV for that. So if you compare the very, very large SUVs, also cross-brand, the X7 would also be my favorite pick. Also, if you, for example, compare it to the main competitor, the Mercedes GLS or something. The BMW XM, I don't really see much sense in that one because it's just added in price. They put 10 more cows in it on the interior. The XM is rather looking back. It's also very aggressive from the design on the exterior and it doesn't give me any big advantage or something. So. This is really the vehicle in that comparison where I say I see the least point in it. The BMW iX is also a very good SUV. Here the electric version, it would be corresponding to the BMW X5 from the combustion or the plug-in hybrid side. So an iX is really also to be recommended. It's a little bit more futuristic, a little bit more modern in the interior approach. They also have the nice high-grade sensor tech or sensor fin on the interior as for the seats delivers a equal amount of comfort and also a very sophisticated ride. It's more than a question if you want to go EV, if you have the charging infrastructure and if the range is suitable for your driving profile and so on. So this can also be a nice choice overall. So at this point then, go electric would be the iX. Overall, I think the X5 is still my favorite and the X1 as the price performance winner. These are my thoughts here today. What do you think? Which one would you pick and why? Tell me in comments and join us for more comparison episodes.